Hey, welcome back to another episode of Studio 118, brought to you by Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come, let us reason, the Lord says, and we're here to do exactly that with you. Another episode, this one's a good one, but first let me introduce myself. I'm Ruben. This is Bungie. Welcome <laughs> once again. Thank, Thank you, you for much. coming back. <clears throat> and we're streaming live here at Calvary South Austin in Austin, Texas. Thank you for joining us. We're streaming live on YouTube, and uh, we're also streaming live on Cable Access Channel 11 in Austin, Texas. So if you're joining us via the tubes right now, we appreciate you doing that. And guys, right, we have a live chat going on on YouTube, so feel free to engage there. Ask your questions. We have a Q&A after our discussion, as we do always, and we would love for you to enter your questions in there so we can have some um, good uh, discussion time after. And also, feel free to share the link to the live stream. Uh, get the word out. Let other people join in on the conversations. Share on YouTube, Instagram, all your social media platforms. And uh, also, you can call in your questions if you have any uh, at 512-576-5433. That's 512-576-5433. We will queue up your question and make sure it is ready to go during our Q&A time. And lastly, if you want to email uh, you can email outreach at calvarysouthaustin.com. So the many ways to get your questions in. So uh, start sending them in now. But we're, today we're talking about the sufficiency of Christ. Uh, really good topic. I'm excited about it. Um, if you joined us uh, last month, we talked about uh, the deity of Christ. And that was a really good discussion. So we talked, we were basically showing... You know, the, the, we're making a case, you know, to show that Jesus Christ is uh, God incarnate. And we're showing how, you know, there's cults out there <clears throat> and other world religions who believe that he's merely a man. But tonight, um, it's kind of related to last month's um, live stream in the sense that we showed, okay, Jesus is God. Uh, there's a triune God. There's a plan of salvation. Jesus came to die for our sins. But today... It's the sufficiency of Christ, Bungie. And we're talking about, okay, Jesus Christ did die on the cross for our sins. Everybody knows that. But now what does that mean, right? How, how much does that extend and that, that whole conversation? So maybe we can talk about, you know, first of all, number one, sufficiency, right? That's kind of a, a big term, maybe a loaded term. But what do we mean when we say sufficiency? Um, you know, what would people understand that to mean? Well, you, you know, the, the concept of sufficiency as it uh, applies to Jesus Christ uh, has everything to do with uh, the question surrounding if his death was sufficient for our salvation. Or in other words, was it enough? Mm -hmm. You know, did, did Jesus do enough work to, uh, to, to provide us with the free gift of, of salvation? Yep. Or uh, is it insufficient in the idea that there's still more work to be done? So when you look at the law, I think uh, I think the Old Testament has like 613 laws mm -hmm. when you quantify the the, the whole take, yeah. uh, Old Testament. And uh, so then we recognize that if you break one law, mm -hmm. then you're guilty of all in the sense that you know if you've broken one law, you're guilty. Because the standard you're, is you're guilty before God. Per perfection, perfection is right? the standard, yeah. right? <clears throat> so the, the the problem that presents us with is. Uh, we're, we're all sinners, mm -hmm. and, and to compound the problem, we're born sinners. Yeah. Uh, we're born with the curse uh, of Adam. Trigger warning. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> Tr trigger warning. Watch out, guys. So seeing how you know, we're all born uh, in sin, we're, we're, we've been imputed mm -hmm. or credited okay. the sin of Adam and Eve, right? So the sin of, sin of Adam is then passed on to all of his descendants. So uh, you might think about it like this, uh, in, 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 in the concept of federal headship. Okay. All right, we have a president who, whether you like him or not, he is our federal head. He represents Represent. all Americans, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so when he uh, you know, does something incredible, he represents all Americans. And when he tweets something silly, he represents all Americans, right? 
So federal headship, we have this federal head uh, who represents all Americans, and that's why when, you know, uh, the president does something that, you know, we take issue with, it affects us, right? It it impacts us. And and when he does something that's awesome, it impacts us in a great way. Uh, So uh, when we consider Adam, Adam was a, a federal head of all humanity. Adam is the first man that God created and everyone on the planet today uh, has come from Adam and Eve. We can all trace our lineage back to Adam and Eve. Yeah. Uh, and there in the garden when Adam uh, chose to sin uh, in, in receiving the forbidden fruit from his wife Eve, uh, he represented all of us as our federal head. And, and as a result, uh, he was cursed, Eve was cursed, the universe was cursed, uh, and now uh, in, in the very act of procreation, you know, the, the, the child conceived uh, it, it receives the curse because uh, Adam represented us all the way back uh, at the beginning. So, uh, so then theologically what we're talking about is Adam's sin is then imputed or credited to the account mm-hmm. of all of his descendants by virtue of federal headship, right? Uh, and, and so, so now we're left with the the problem of uh, needing forgiveness, and, uh, not only because we've been imputed the yeah. sin of Adam, but also because uh, in our own decision making we've sinned as well. So right. uh, we're all guilty before God. Uh, we're all imputed the sin of Adam, and uh, we've sinned in our own decisions, in our, in our own thoughts, in our own actions. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, so we, we're all in need of salvation. So then the question is, how do we get saved? Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're going to get into works, sure. right? We're going to talk about works in a minute. But, but then the, uh, you know, the question is, if Jesus was sent to, uh, to, to die for our sins, is his work sufficient? Yeah, and this gets into the topic of the sufficiency the, the sufficiency of Jesus Christ, uh, and when we take these two topics together, you know we had the the deity of Jesus last week as we considered uh, his uh, humanity as being the Son of Man and his deity as being the Son of God, and Jesus having these two natures, mm-hmm. uh, and so that's that deals with the who of Jesus, uh, and now we're de- dealing with the what of Jesus. So who is Jesus, God incarnate? What did he do? What did he do when he died on the cross? Yeah. And, and was that work sufficient <clears throat> or was it insufficient? So that's, uh, that's the conversation that we're having uh, yeah, tonight. So that, yeah, we're setting the stage here, right? And as a viewer, right, I, you might be thinking, okay, what, are we quibbling here, right? Is this just a matter of, you know, dotting the I's and crossing the T's? Are we just having a, an in-house debate or are we just kind of quibbling over semantics, that kind of stuff? Why is this important? Why should our viewers care, right? And, you know, maybe we can set that stage now. We've, we've described what sufficiency means, what yeah. kind of alluded what, what it's about. But now why, why should our viewers care? Well, I, I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, when we get into this question of what did Jesus do there on the cross, uh, brings us to the topic of propitiation, uh, which uh, could also be rendered atonement. Okay. Uh, there, there's a, a one way that I always remember the meaning of the word atonement because it breaks into at one meant, mm. right? So at one meant, you know, the, the atonement, it's a, a propitiating sacrifice or, or it's a, it's a, um, it's a way of appeasing yeah. something that's been done wrong. So, uh, you know, if you, uh, uh, break a law, right. Uh, you know, the way that you atone for that is, you know, paying, uh, paying your debt to society, you yeah. know, is, is, a, is a form of atoning, you know. Uh, but if, you, if, if someone comes along and makes a sacrifice, like you know, I, I, I break a law uh, and now I have a debt that I could never pay off, right? I, I owe a billion dollars because I, you know, destroyed, and, uh, you know. Was it you? <laughs> it was me. <laughs> no, but uh, if, if, I, if I can't pay my debt to society, <clears throat> but someone comes along and writes the check for that, yeah. You know, that is an atoning sacrifice that they're making, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so, so that brings us back to Jesus Christ. Like the, the, the concept of Jesus' atonement is that he offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins in order to appease God the Father. Uh, he offered himself as a sacrifice. He, he became a victim for us 
you know, so that we could then turn around and receive the forgiveness of sins because he's paid the price, right? And, and so uh, in this conversation about the atonement, uh, was, the, was that atoning sacrifice sufficient to cover all of my sins? And the reason why the viewer ought to care about this is because we're all sinners. Yeah. And if Jesus uh, has atoned for the sins of the whole world, that's a benefit to every single one of us. It's something that I would want to know about if I didn't know. If I didn't know what Jesus did on the cross and how it impacts my eternity, mm -hmm. it's something that I would want to know about. Right, right. At the same time, uh, if I'm hearing about this, uh, and then I find out that, well, Jesus work on the cross, his atoning sacrifice was only for some people. I'd want to know about that too. Yeah. And that brings up the concept of limited atonement because mm -hmm. there, there are some Christians uh, who believe in what's known as limited atonement, right? This is uh, part of the Calvinistic system of theology, mm -hmm. right? And, and Calvinists are Christians who uh, subscribe to a very specific system of theology, which is broken down in the word tulip. And we don't, yeah. have, don't, we don't have time to get into every single uh, letter and what each one means, but the L in tulip means limited atonement. Now that's a scary concept yeah. because what that means is that the atonement, the atoning sacrifice or the appeasing sacrifice that Jesus offered is not for all, but only for a limited amount of people. Very interesting. So you mentioned Calvinism, right? And so this is a doctrine, I'm guessing, that stretches as far back, what is it, 1500s, sure. around there? Yeah. So this has been around for quite a while. 16th and, century. And yeah, maybe there's Christians out there that are right now hearing this and like, well, I limited what, you know? And so that's, hopefully, you're starting to understand now why this is an important topic. Number one, it's, it's a topic that's been discussed for ages now. Right. But it does have... Uh, you know, real theological implications in terms of who gets saved, who becomes part of the body of Christ, who is going to make it into eternity with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit versus being damned for eternity, right? right. So th these are real consequences that we're talking about. So we're not just quibbling over semantics. Hopefully you can understand that. Right. If, uh, if the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ is limited... Well, then we might want to know limited to whom, right? right? <laughs> Did uh, I make it? Yes. Right. Uh, so, uh, and in, a, in an attempt to defend that position, you know, most Calvinists will offer up a statement that I agree with, <clears throat> though I don't think they fully agree with it. And the statement is that the atoning sacrifice of Christ is sufficient for all, but only efficient for the elect. Right? Yes. <laughs> and it's, it's, it, it's almost like, you know, saying, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give everyone a really nice gift, but I'm not going to give it to everybody. So the words were spoken, <laughs> right. and immediately people think, I'm going to receive a gift. But, but in reality, I'm in just going to give it to... You've already made up your mind as to who's going to get the gift. Right, right. Okay. And it's not going to be everyone. So the statement, sufficient for all, but efficient for the elect, I mean, I agree with that. At, at, on the surface level, right? If, if by that what we mean is that Christ literally died for the sins of the whole world, but only those who believe in Jesus will receive the effects of that atoning sacrifice. If that's what mm -hmm. we mean by that statement, then yeah. yeah. I totally believe that, that, that the atoning sacrifice is sufficient for everyone. It, 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 the sacrifice is enough to save every single person. It, was, it is what was needed to be done. Right. Nothing else. Jesus really did complete it all on the cross. He said, it is finished, yes. right? right? Right. So it's sufficient for everyone. Uh, but then it's only going to be effective in the lives of those who believe, right? Uh, I think that uh, John, the Apostle John put it, put it plainly in 1 John chapter 2 where he says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation. There's that word atonement. Yep. It's translated propitiation in the, in the New King James Version, but, but that word it can also be, the, the Greek word can also be rendered atonement. So he himself is the atonement, the appeasing sacrifice, if you will, for our sins. He's talking about the church. But then says, and not for our sins only, but also for the whole world. So you can't 
pull out of this text this idea that, well, it's, it's only for the elect. Mm -hmm. Because the elect would be in the first part of that statement. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Mm -hmm. That's the elect, because he's talking about our being the church. But then he says, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. And, and, and while we, we might be able to wrangle with the, the concept of the whole world and say, well, it's just some of every type of person in the world, sure. that doesn't really bear out in proper exegesis because the, the whole world is being used in contrast to our speaking of the church. Sure. So we might uh, render uh, 1 John 2, verse 2 in this way. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for the churches or the elect's sins and not for uh, uh, the elect's only, but also for the rest of the whole world, mm -hmm. right? That's not limited atonement. Right. That is completely sufficient atonement for every single person in the world. Truly for all, yep. So if, limited, if the doctrine of limited atonement is true, then the statement sufficient for all can't be true. Because limited atonement, by the very nature of the terminology, is that it's only sufficient for the elect. Yeah. Yeah, when we use the word sufficient, we're saying it, it is what is needed. It is, it is what is needed to complete something. That, you know, so by definition, you're right. When you use the word sufficient, you're meaning something that is all-encompassing. I can't say sufficient and limited. Yeah. It just, in the, when you're applying it in the same sense, right? right? Yeah. In the same sense, at the same time, right? right. So if, if I'm saying that the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ is sufficient for the whole world, then, then I can't say it's limited. It's limited a, yeah. I can't say it's limited atonement. Now, now I, I can say in this sense that it's limited by virtue of a person must receive the gift. Like if I said, I'm going to give a million dollars to every single person in the world, and whoever will receive it will be a millionaire. Mm -hmm. There's no contradiction there. You know, I'm ready to, you know, give a million dollars to every, uh, don't, don't call me. I, I don't have a million dollars, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but if I were to, you know, if I were able to do that and say, I, I'm going to give a million dollars to every single person in the world, mm -hmm. right. And whoever will receive it will be a millionaire. Uh, then the people who don't want to receive it, they're not going to be a millionaire. So in that sense, it's, that would be sufficient for everyone to be a millionaire, but it's only efficient for those who receive it, right? Yeah. And that's, the, that's what we mean when we say it's sufficient for all, but efficient for, for you know, those who believe, right? So it's not limited except by a person's choice to reject it. Just based on the scriptures, right? right. Those who receive it. Yep. Yeah. But when the Calvinist says limited atonement, that's not what they're talking about. Yeah. They, they actually believe that you know, Jesus died on the cross for the elect. Yes. The, the same God who died for our sins is the same one who is choosing which those elect are. So he is right. the one that is apparently sufficient, but he's also the one that is doing the limiting. Yes. Yeah. So when you listen to, you know, the, the, the most popular Calvinist teachers, what they're basically saying when they say sufficient for all, what they're saying is that, you know, had God chosen more elect, then the same sacrifice would be enough for those people as well. Mm -hmm. He just didn't choose them, so he didn't die for them either. Right. You know, that's the basic concept of limited atonement under the, this theological camp known as Calvinism. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, and it's not my, my intention to, you know, tell the Calvinists that might be watching that, you know, they're not, you know, a, a great Christian. You know, we, we totally believe that Calvinism is part of Christianity. It's, you know, uh, uh, it's one camp of, of several. You know, there's the Arminians, there's the, you know, the... the uh, middle knowledge group and, and, you know, there's those who embrace federal headship and there's different groups, you know, that, that, uh, that uh, embrace different ideas about these concepts. But uh, at the end of the day, when we talk about the sufficiency of Christ's atoning work, what we're saying is that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, the church, but not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world, which then brings us to the topic of Christian universalism and universalism mm -hmm. in general, right? So this, yeah, so we're moving away from limited atonement now. We see that there are, uh, there are real consequences here when you start um, breaking down these theological concepts. And so that if there truly is limited atonement, then that would mean that there are those who, um, by no fault of their own, it really is God's choosing, they will not be entering into heaven. They will not be entering into the body of Christ. They are damned for eternity. So that is a difficult concept to, to swallow, but it is something that is borne out by that 
limited atonement worldview. So keep that in mind, viewer. Now we're moving on to what you said. And, and, we, don't, and we don't agree with that. Of course, of course. Yeah, we, we don't subscribe to the idea that atonement is limited to a specific group that God you know, chose from before the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. And everyone who's not part of that elect group has no chance to receive that atoning sacrifice. We believe that uh, the atonement of Jesus Christ is sufficient for every single person. And we all have the same opportunity to receive that free gift of forgiveness that's received when we trust yeah. in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Um, but when we talk about, uh, you know, the atoning work being sufficient for everyone mm. and, and it being an, an opportunity for every single person to receive, uh, you know, that lends itself to mm. this next heresy, uh, which is Christian universalism. Okay, so universalism. So let's, let's break that down. There's a lot of big words being thrown around today, but let's, let's try to break it down. I'm a big guy. Yep. This is true. So, <laughs> I only know big words. I am not. Yeah, don't adjust your uh, your settings on the TV there. <laughs> I'm not standing closer. He's not. No tricks being played here. Near, far. <laughs> All right. So you know, universalism is the belief that everyone eventually gets saved. Mm -hmm. Right. So you know, stepping back away from the Christian camp. Right. Uh, if we just talk about universalism, it's, it's basically uh, centered around the idea that all religions lead up the same mountain you know, to God. Yeah. Uh, all religions are uh, equally valid mm -hmm. paths to salvation. So that's universalism is, you know, uh, it, as long as you're sincere in your faith, <clears throat> you're going to you're going to get saved. Yeah. Right. Christian universalism, which is a, a, a rapidly growing, growing heresy mm -hmm. and, and has per, been pervasive in the church for, the, for several years now, this is based on the idea that everyone's going to get saved because Jesus died for everyone's sins. So they, they believe in universal atonement. They, they believe that, that the atonement of Jesus Christ is sufficient for all mm -hmm. And you don't need to receive it for it to be uh, uh, effective in your life. Yeah. So, so, so these Christian universalists believe that you know, we're saved by, by the, the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Right? They believe that, that when Jesus died on the cross, it was an atoning, appeasing sacrifice that pleased God the Father. God the Father received the sacrifice that Jesus offered. And now, much like Adam's sin was imputed to all mankind, they believe that, Ad, uh, that, that the, the Lord Jesus, the second Adam, his sacrifice is now automatically imputed to all mankind. Therefore, regardless of whether somebody trusted in Jesus or not, everyone ends up saved. Yeah. You know, and I've, I remember coming across this concept when, um, so Rob Bell, mm. He's he's a big name out there. So he's written books like you know Velvet Elvis and the the one that he deals with Christian universalism. It was his own take about what he believes uh, happens with those who have never even trusted. And it's called Love Wins. Right. And that's that's kind of alluding to what he's getting at is that even if you didn't um, put your faith in Jesus in this life, that God's love is so overpowering that He'll give you another chance in between, you know, the, the afterlife and your true destination, that he'll give you another chance to accept him, you know, in the afterlife. And yes. that it's kind of like a, a weird kind of purgatory, you know. So you died, but you still get another chance. I don't know what goes on there, but ultimately he he's emphasizing the love of God, right? And while de-emphasizing the justice aspect. And so that's where I... I became familiar with this concept of universalism is that eventually he says that eventually everyone will get saved because love wins in the end. Right. God's love is so overpowering. So, you know, uh, yeah, so overwhelming that you will have no choice but to accept that even after you die. Yeah. So, which is kind of a, a, a twist on uh, the, the uh, irresistible grace, the eye from tulip. Sure. Right. Uh, except that, but then coupled together with maybe Roman Catholic, you know, concept of purgatory. Yeah. You know, that you might be able to resist God's grace here in this world, get you. but then in, in this <laughs> purgatory place, 
or, yeah. or, or maybe this C.S. Lewis kind mm -hmm. of, you know, limbo between, yeah. you know, uh, earth and heaven, uh, that you'll have an opportunity to experience the irresistible grace of God. And, and, and in that state, you'll, you'll, you'll uh, yeah. receive it, right? Is it true that you only accept the S in tulips, which is <laughs> sick beard? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I, I did not know there was an S in yeah. tulips, but... Uh, <laughs> it's a new doctrine, yeah. You got that Calvin, Calvin beard going on. Yeah, yeah. but I, I don't drink uh, IPAs and I don't smoke, <laughs> smoke cigars either, so I'm not a I'm not a. But you do have your Renaissance clothing. <laughs> do you? you yeah, but okay. I only wear that on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> when you're LARPing. <laughs> <laughs> because I play. But, uh, nice. So... Uh, so this this concept of Christian universalism, uh, the the problem with this what I would call heresy, uh, it's made its way into the Christian mm -hmm. church, but it's not Christian theology. Uh, the, the, you know, Paul's very clear. The, the New Testament epistles very clear. Jesus very clear that people end up in hell. Right. There, there's no getting around this, and and. and uh, there are some who take it out to, okay, so everybody you know, that rejects Jesus ends up in hell, but then after a certain amount of time in hell, you know, their minds are changed. They finally receive Jesus Christ and are saved at that point. So that's another form yep. you know, of Christian universalism. There's, there's different ideas of Christian universalism, but at the end of the day, the concept is that the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ eventually uh, affects every single person so that they can be saved, right? And while I do believe that the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ is sufficient for every single person, I believe that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world mm -hmm. and that the whole, everybody in the world has the same opportunity to receive the benefit of that appeasing sacrifice. So it's clearly sufficient, entirely sufficient. Uh, the problem with this concept of Christian universalism is that it ignores the third form of imputation. Uh, and, and just to be clear about this, uh, the Bible presents us with three different acts of imputation that, uh, uh, that could potentially be applied to every single person. Yeah. The two, the first two are automatic. Mm -hmm. So the first act of imputation occurred, as I pointed out earlier, when Adam's sin is imputed or credited to the account of all of his descendants. Yeah. In... Uh, you know, at the moment of conception, uh, a person receives the imputed guilt of our federal head, Adam. Yep. And so in this way, we are born with a sin nature uh, just by nature of who our federal head is or our father, Adam, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the first act of imputation. The second act of imputation happened on the cross. The Bible tells us very plainly that it's there on the cross where the sins of the world were imputed to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He bore our sins on the tree, right? So uh, there on the cross, the sins of the world were placed on Christ Jesus. But it's important to understand that there's one sin that wasn't. So the sins of the world, except for one, because there's one unforgivable sin. This is known as the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So Jesus received the imputation of all of our sins except for the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Just to break that down a little bit, it's, under, it's important to understand that the Holy Spirit came with a threefold ministry. Yeah. You want to break that down? So, now you put me on spot too. Uh, you don't have to I'm be on bad spot. with the list, but... So it's, it's the... To, uh, uh, convict, to convict the world, the world of, of sin, sin, righteousness, and judgment. Righteousness and judgment. Exactly right. Look at this guy. Yeah. Got it. So, <laughs> so after uh, after years uh, of youth camp, watching him put people on the spot with the <laughs> Bible trivia, <laughs> just takes me a while with this you old mind. It. You did it. So the Holy Spirit is sent uh, to to reach unbelievers, mm -hmm. to to convict them of sin, to convict them of righteousness, and to convict them of judgment. So he, he, the Holy Spirit uh, convicts us of sin, 
right, uh, to, to help us understand that we're sinners and that we need the forgiveness of Christ. Uh, he convicts us of, of righteousness by helping us to understand that Christ is the perfect standard of righteousness. The proof of that is seen in the fact that God the Father received the sacrifice of his only begotten Son uh, and, uh, and, and brought him into heaven uh, after the ascension. Uh, at the time of the ascension, Jesus entered into the glory that he had with the Father from before uh, uh, the, the incarnation, right? And, and so the confirmation of his righteousness or sinlessness, you might mm -hmm. say, uh, is seen in the, the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension uh, of Jesus Christ. So, uh, so the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. He convicts us of Christ's righteousness to help us to see how far we've fallen short mm -hmm. of the perfect standard, uh, and then of judgment, that we're all going to be judged. Yep. At the end of the day, we're all going to stand before a holy God and give an account for our life, right? Uh, so it's in this conviction, it's in the conviction that the Holy Spirit brings to each person, convicting of sin, uh, righteousness, and judgment, that the Holy Spirit is drawing us to Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself, right? So it's at that point in time then when the Holy Spirit comes to convict us of sin and righteousness and judgment that he's drawing us to the cross so that we might believe in Jesus Christ. The unbeliever says, uh-uh, I don't buy it. I'm not, I'm not believing in this, right? And a continuing rejection of that conviction eventually results in the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That might happen in this life and, and a person might still continue to live uh, after having committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, or it might happen at the point in time of death when, uh, when someone in their final breath uh, just continues you know, to, uh, in their heart, reject uh, the conviction of sin that the Holy Spirit was bringing uh, to their life. Uh, but regardless of when exactly the Lord determines that someone has uh, committed this unforgivable sin, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's at that point in time when they shut themselves off from the third act of imputation. And the third act of imputation occurs when a person receives the testimony of the Holy Spirit. They, they've been convicted of their sin. Uh, they've been convicted of Christ's righteousness. And they've been convicted about uh, the, the judgment that they're about to receive. Yeah. Right, uh, And as they place their faith in Jesus Christ, it's at that moment when the third act of imputation uh, occurs. And that's when the righteousness of Jesus Christ is then imputed or credited to the account uh, of the believer, right? Uh, so that then undo, uh, uh, it, 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 uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it, it reverses the curse, yeah. right? This reverses the curse. Uh, so the person who received the imputation of Christ's righteousness uh, at that point in time is no longer under the federal headship of Adam, mm -hmm. but now they're under the federal headship of Jesus Christ. And so in this way, Jesus, through the atoning sacrifice, which is sufficient for all, that sufficient sacrifice now is applied to the believer. With all his benefits, yeah. With, with all the benefits. And as the sin of Adam was credited to the account of every single person, in, in a similar uh, sort of way, uh, then the righteousness of Jesus Christ is applied to the believer, thereby null, uh, null and voiding yeah. uh, the, the sins that they're guilty of, as well as the curse that they received under the federal headship of Adam. Yeah. Yep. That's a very good explanation. And, you know, for the viewer, just real quick, uh, before we continue elaborating on this, just, just so you know, we're not, you know, speaking... Uh, out of the void or anything like that. There are, there are Bible verses that we, um, we are um, uh, using to back up these, uh, these concepts, right? So uh, when you're talking about the role of the Holy Spirit found in John chapter 16, you read that for homework, and talking about the blasphemy of the Spirit found in Matthew chapter 12, and then this, this concept of imputation, I think it's first found in Genesis chapter 15 when Abraham believed God. And to him, it was imputed yep. as righteousness, right? And it's, it's typically translated credited. Credited, right. You know, but credited, imputed, accounted, this is yep. all coming from the same Hebrew or the same Greek word. Yeah. So, yeah, again, taking the whole of Scripture, we do see this, this uh, number one, reality that, yes, there are people who do not inherit the kingdom of God. And when, when you're talking about that, I was thinking about uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I believe, where he lists, Paul, you know, lists a bunch of uh, sinful traits 
And if your life is character, characterized by those things, he says, these people will not inherit the yeah. kingdom Galatians, of God. Galatians 5, yep. where we find that list, yeah. And so there's the reality that not everybody is going to make it. Right. And just by virtue of that, for me, it seals the deal. That right. Universalism is not something that is, is grounded in, in reality. It's not grounded for sure in scripture because of this concept that, again, how I mentioned that Rob Bell and others who ascribe to this, they seem to be emphasizing the love of God, but they want to de-emphasize or just completely remove God's just nature. And I, I think that's what is, is kind of gets, creeping into the church, right? This, it's tugging at your heartstrings. Like, I mean, God is love, right? right. First, John, first uh, John 4, 9, I think, God is love. And so you want to be pulled in by this idea that, well, I, I only want to believe in a God who, who, who just completely loves, and, and, and I don't want to see any punishment. I don't want to see anybody. Well, you know, I'm, a, I'm a parent. When I have to punish my child, right. it, it's not a pretty thing. It's not something that I look forward to. I don't think any parent does that. And so, right. But we want to hold on to that aspect, and we want to say, well, therefore, any act of punishment, even though it's warranted, is not just. And so now that starts leading us into these other wild doctrines like Christian universalism, saying, well, in that case, everybody can make it eventually, you know, and, and soon enough, I'm sure we're already starting to hear some of this, is that everybody just makes it, not eventually, but just by virtue of Jesus dying on the cross, everybody's going to make it. So we don't even right. have to evangelize. We don't have to do any of these other things that scripture is clearly laying out for us to do, right? Um, so yeah, that's a very good explanation about We've, we've covered kind of both ends of the spectrum. So we had limited atonement. It seems to limit the um, sufficiency of Christ and saying that it's only applicable to certain people. Right. So in that case, did Christ really do it all? Did he really complete what he was set out to do? But then when you're talking about Christian universalism, they, they want to go above and beyond and right. say, not only did he complete it, but he completed it so that everybody, regardless of whether you believe in him or not, or... or commit your life to him or not, you're in. You're in by, by default. Right. And so there are two ends of the spectrum here, and we want to avoid those. Right Here at this church, here at Calvary South Austin, we do not hold to these two ends of the spectrum. We, we prefer to follow Scripture, and where Scripture says that there is a reality that some will not make it, based on what we see that, well, Christ did die for all, but it's for those who receive it. Right? That is when it becomes efficacious. You have to make that, right. that free will decision. Right. Yeah, we have to uh, embrace the federal headship of Jesus Christ by faith in his atoning sacrifice so that then we receive that third act of imputation, yeah. which covers all of our sins and helps us to avoid the unforgivable sin. Yep. Yeah. Right. So the sin of Adam imputed to every single person. Our sins were imputed to Christ on the cross. Mm -hmm all of our sins, and the only sin not covered on the cross is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And when we trust in Jesus Christ, we receive the, the benefit of the atoning sacrifice, that appeasing sacrifice enables Christ to be just and the justifier of the one who trusts in him so that the third act of imputation, the imputation, the crediting of his righteousness to my spiritual account occurs at the moment of faith. And that's when the believer is justified in a fun way to remember justified is it's just as if I'd never sinned. <laughs> right? Yes. My childhood, uh, church memories are coming back now. There they are. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, one of the, one of the sections of scripture that you can go to, to learn more about how, uh, Jesus, uh, the difference between the federal headship of Jesus and Adam. Uh, Romans chapter 5, it's uh, beginning at verse 12. Mm. Uh, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him mm. who was to come. Uh, but the free gift is not like the offense, for if by the one man's offense many died, uh, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. So uh, in this, we see how Jesus then comes along and reverses the curse. And, and that this concept is also uh, uh, more clearly uh, explained in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul's writing about the resurrection. 
And he tells us that Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, or the second Adam, came from heaven. And so there you see uh, that we, ha- we all have the option uh, to be under the federal headship of Adam mm-hmm. or to be under the federal headship of Jesus Christ. If we remain in Adam's family, uh, then we remain, yeah. There we go. I had to do it. <laughs> then, we, you know, if we re- remain under Adam's federal headship, we remain in Adam's family, uh, and, uh, and in Adam's family, we're still in our sins. Uh, therefore, the second imputation doesn't apply to us. Mm-hmm. But if we're by faith under the federal headship of Jesus Christ, then the second imputation applies to us because we've received the third imputation of Christ's righteousness. Yep. Awesome. Boom. So don't be a lurch, guys. <laughs> oh, <wow>. <laughs> Except that third <laughs> imputation, guys. <laughs> oh, we're bringing it all, guys. We're bringing it all. So <laughs> right here, I just want to take a quick pause just to talk to our viewers real quick. Uh, thank you for joining us. Studio 118 coming live from Austin, Texas, here at Calvary South Austin. We are streaming live on YouTube, youtube.com slash Calvary South Austin. Uh, uh, we're doing this once a month. Uh, today's a special um, a special episode. We're doing one week early, but usually we are streaming the first week of the month, first Thursday of the month. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, but we have just to remind you, we have a QA and uh, a after our discussion tonight. And so if you want to get your questions in, you have a few options here. Number one, you can uh, join us on the YouTube live chat, enter your questions there. We will queue them up. You can also email your questions to us at outreach at calvarysouthaustin.com. Or if you are watching on cable access channel 11, or just you just love using the telephone rather than other electronics, you can call in your questions at 512-576-5433, and uh, 512-576-5433. Also, I did uh, forget to mention at the outset, but uh, here at Calvary South Austin, we have opened up the doors to our church here uh, to have live services. Uh, we've taken the necessary uh, safety measures to make sure everybody's keeping socially distant during this time. Uh, we've got hand sanitizer, uh, masks, and uh, we just invite you to come out uh, to join us in face-to-face fellowship as we read through the Bible, as we uh, partake in uh, praise and worship, and we just want to, uh, yeah, have that fellowship. And we have uh, our regular services on Sunday mornings at 9.15 a.m. and 11.15 a.m., and also on Wednesday evenings, we have our service at 7 p.m. We also, for those that are still in the high-risk category, uh, and still uh, feeling a little timid about coming out, we do have that live stream service on Sunday mornings at 11.15 a.m., and we're streaming uh, the Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. So if you have any questions about any of that stuff, we'd love to see you out here, but if you have any questions, feel free to call our church at 512-576-5433, and we'll be glad to answer any of those questions for you. Well, all right, so... Back to our discussion on sufficiency of Christ. So we've covered, you know, why is so this much. important? Yeah, we've covered a lot already, but <laughs> we're, we've just answered the question about, you know, why is this important for our viewers? So I hope you understand that uh, this is not mere, you know, theological kind of ivory tower babbling here, but we're, we're concentrating on what is Scripture telling us about what has Christ accomplished? So we talked about limited atonement. We talked about Christian universalism, but then there, there are other matters to worry about or to to think about and think about deeply. So when it comes to Christ's efficiency, you know, what did he accomplish on the cross? There are those who will straight out say, yes, Christ died for you, but, and it's always that word, but, Christ died for all and Christ said it is finished, but. Basically, they're trying to negate everything that came before that. And they say, you must do certain works. Right. So people will still try to say Christ is sufficient and his work is sufficient, but there's these things that we need to do. So maybe let's try uh, talking about some of those things. Yeah, well, this certainly brings us, uh, you know, to uh, a point of apologetics, right? Apologetics is, is a reasonable defense of, of our faith, right? And, and if we understand the sufficiency of Christ, uh, then we're better equipped to be able to deal with some of these groups who want to come along uh, and take you to James and say faith without works is dead, you know, and, and then start adding works to faith, right? Yep. Uh, now, Paul is quite clear, you know, that uh, there is a remnant that is uh, according to grace, and if grace uh, is grace, then it's no more of works. And if works is 
you know, the way that we're saved, then it's no more of grace, right? right? So in other words, Paul was simply saying that we're either saved by grace or we're saved by works, but yeah. not of both. That's in Galatians, I believe, yeah. And, and then he takes it further and, and says that we're saved by grace. Mm-hmm. So, so then, what real, do we... What, I guess real quick, if we can pause there, because um, you brought up a good point where you're saying this is kind of a, an arena of apologetics, right? And right here we're dealing with a theological topic. And I just want to mention, you know, this is something that really impacted me when I, when I first became a believer and I started uh, becoming, getting challenged about why I believe certain things about Christianity. And um, that's what introduced me into apologetics. But, you know, it really wasn't until I, I, I made it a commitment, at least in my life, to get grounded in theology first. Right. I didn't, I didn't want to kind of muddy the waters, so to speak about learning all these apologetic arguments and even starting to read uh, anti-Christian literature or, you know, videos and media, that kind of stuff. I wanted to make sure that I was grounded in what does the Bible teach, right. systematic theology. And that really helped me to get a strong grounding in my faith. And then I started, you know, kind of branching out and say, okay, what are some apologetic answers to the cults and to different religions and that kind of stuff? So just to put it out there, you know, Christian, if you're wondering about apologetics, I would definitely highly encourage you to get grounded in theology, and this is one of the, the topics of theology that we're talking about, the sufficiency of Christ. So. Right. Uh, it gets back to the analogy of the law enforcement agents who uh, go in search of counterfeit money. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't teach these agents uh, how to look at counterfeit money. Uh, they teach them how to look at real money. Mm-hmm. They make them study real money because if you know what real money looks like, then you'll be able to instantly spot the counterfeits. Uh, counterfeits are constantly changing. Yeah. So if you learn the counterfeit first, uh, you know, you, know what, you, you don't have the standard. Uh, whereas if you study the real bill first and know uh, the ins and outs of what real money looks like, well then you'll spot the counterfeit regardless of how it's been altered. Uh, and that's true of uh, Christian theo- theology versus the cults. And anytime I see a new believer wanting to instantly jump into a study of the cults, you know, I, <laughs> I tend to discourage it. You know, yeah. it's like, you know, okay, well, there's time for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but let's make sure you know the essentials of the Christian faith right now. Yeah. Most Christians couldn't even give you a list uh, of the majority of the essentials that, that we find in the scriptures. Uh, I've done a whole study on, on Christian essentials. You can go to the website, calvarysouthaustin.com, type into the search engine essentials, uh, and it'll pull up the whole series I did on the Christian essentials. Uh, and, and that's where we really need to start is what are the essentials of the Christian faith? I did another study on the first principles that Paul mm-hmm. uh, explained in Hebrews chapter 6. Yep. You can study through uh, my Hebrews 6 study to consider the first principles you know, of the Christian faith. This is one of those first principles. This is one of those essentials, the atoning work, the appeasing sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And if you know this doctrine, then you'll know when you hear the heresy. Mm -hmm. You'll know when someone comes along and starts trying to add works to the atoning sacrifice. And and the uh, the verse I was uh, talking about earlier is Romans 11. Okay. It's in Romans 11, uh, verse 5. Ah, that's right. This is where Paul says at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it's no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it's of works, it's no longer grace. Uh, Otherwise, work is no longer work. Uh, So the idea being, it it can't be both. Uh, And and when the the cults run to James and say, well, James says that it's, you know, faith, that, that faith without works is dead. And then springboard from that verse to, therefore, faith plus works equals salvation. It's like, well, no, that's not what James said. He just said, if you're not working, you have a dead faith. In other words, there's no evidence of your faith unless you actually are serving the Lord. If, If you say you have faith in Jesus Christ and then you're not serving the Lord Jesus Christ then uh, the, the faith you claim to have isn't borne out by the works that you're doing. James does not say faith plus works equals salvation. Faith plus works equals the reception of the atoning sacrifice. He doesn't say that. Yeah. So 
then when it comes to understanding what the sufficiency of Christ is all about, how, how it's tied to the atoning sacrifice, and, and as we consider how it's sufficient for everyone, and then sufficient in the sense that uh, it sufficiently covers every single sin, well, if that's true, then there's no need for us to work our way to heaven. Yep. If it sufficiently covers every sin and it sufficiently provides the righteousness of Jesus Christ to cover my entire account, well, then there's no works necessary for salvation. But this doesn't stop uh, groups from introducing mm -hmm. works like baptism. Yeah. Right? So we're going to talk about what's known as baptismal regeneration. Now, uh, you know, as Christians, I mean, we've been given... The, the command to go and baptize in water, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? right. So we totally believe in the sacrament of water baptism. Mm -hmm. I, I think that every born-again believer ought to be water baptized. Why? Well, that's what Jesus told us to yeah, do, right? To. This does not mm -hmm. suggest that we need to be water baptized in order to get saved. And yet there's a, there are many groups who actually teach that in one form or another. Right. You want to you want to bring up some of those groups? Yeah. So the you know the one that I'm um, most familiar with is um, Catholicism. Mm -hmm. You know, just because I grew up with, uh, I still have Roman Catholic family members and in laws, um, and so there is that aspect where I you know you hear that throwing around infant baptism even right? right. And so my understanding there is, as one of the sacraments in Roman Catholicism, is uh, it includes baptism as an infant. Preferably. And what this does is that, according to the catechism of the Catholic Church, is that the baptism removes the original stain of sin right. brought about by Adam, as we were talking about earlier. And so at that moment, you are technically saved. Yes. You are technically adopted into the family of Jesus Christ as an infant. Without having made a conscious decision, that, that sprinkling on the head or the dipping on the head, as you can see there, is that that removes the original stain of sin from Adam. Right. And so that is part and parcel of salvation. That is the mechanism through which you get saved. It's not even plus. That is salvation right there. And so that, you know, that's the one I'm most familiar with. So they, they definitely do include it as dogma, as part of the catechism and the sacraments, one of the sacraments that you must uh, abide by. It covers your salvation until your first sin. Yes, until, <laughs> until you commit a, a venial or a mortal sin, right? That's right. And then now you need other, other sacraments, other right. works and penance and all that kind of stuff. Yep. And so, but yeah, at that moment, um, how can you say that Christ's work on the cross is sufficient, that right. it is enough? It is, it is enough only to a certain point, then it's not enough. I mean, is, is Jesus God or not? Is it, is it for all time? You know, because when I read in Hebrews, right, that he died once, and for all, I think it's in Hebrews. Yes. You know, somebody fact checking, but yeah, that's true. Yeah. So he died yeah, once and for, yeah, he would die <laughs> once and for all. Once and for all time. Right. And it's, it's a one time sacrifice. Yes. Otherwise, you know, why, why did he die on the cross in the first place? So that's, you know, what get, really gets my gears turning in my brain here when I start seeing, okay, that this is the mechanism through which you get saved. Ah, I thought it was faith. So, and, and then what, what this unravels as well is the whole reversing of the curse, mm -hmm. right? So think about it like this, that when Jesus died on the cross, he was reversing the curse by undoing Adam's sin for those who believe, right? So now, if his sacrifice is ultimately to act as our federal head, undoing Adam's federal headship, mm -hmm. And, and we're under Adam's federal headship because of the imputation of his sin. Not because we sinned first, but because Adam sinned first. We're imputed the sin nature, and then we carry that out by our own decisions. But ultimately, that ties back to Adam, right? So if baptism in the Roman Catholic Church releases you from Adam's guilt... And you are as Adam was in the garden, and then you choose your first sin. How does the work of Jesus Christ cover that? 
there's a deep theological issue in that whole doctrine that unravels mm-hmm. the whole federal headship concept of what Jesus did on the cross. And at, you know, as Jesus comes as the second Adam to undo what the first Adam did, if in water baptism in the Roman Catholic Church, you become your own Adam, so to speak, yeah. who comes and dies for, right. for that sin? Yep. It's, that's that's, a, that's <laughs> yeah. some deep theology right there to, that, yeah. that they're not working out. Mm-hmm. But it's uh, when you start unraveling, when you start pulling that, that thread and start realizing how disruptive mm-hmm. this idea of baptism or regeneration for the infant, right, is, that's dangerous. That is a dangerous, dangerous doctrine. Yeah, and, and usually, like you were mentioning, how in my conversations with Roman Catholics, right, it, they usually do go, they revert to the James 2 passage, yes. where they do want to include works into the the act of salvation, right? right? So it's just like you said, it, it, and that they say, because of this, therefore, it's faith plus works. Right. And um, that's what we're trying to unravel here, that it's it's not the case, you know, just scripturally speaking. Yeah, the, the problem, though, is that they use the word grace as a blanket statement under which you find all the works, mm-hmm. right? So in Roman Catholic yeah, theology... True. The concept is that God has been gracious enough to give you sacraments to do. So there's this storehouse of grace in, yeah. in the church, right? Uh, and, and so God pours out grace through Mary, right, mm-hmm. uh, into the church. And then the priests distribute that grace through the sacraments. Now, how do you... How do you square that with the text I just wrote from, uh, read from Romans on it's, it's either grace, grace yeah. <laughs> or it's works? Yep. Clear distinction. You cannot take works and place them under the umbrella of grace. Yeah. Impossible. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, so grace meaning it's unmerited favor of God. Yep. Free gift. Unmerited means there's there's no work that you can do to earn it. Yes. It's unmerited. It means that God gives it to you out of his own love, out of his own will. But yet, that's exactly what I see, that, that circle where you receive the initial grace. And it, there's that word we were talking about earlier, right? The infusion. Right. So yeah. it's yes. not imputation. No. According to the catechism, is it is an infusion. The way I like to think about it and make me hungry, but it's like I think of it as a jelly donut. Mm. Where when you take that sacrament to remove that original stain, you are dealt an initial infusion of grace until you commit your first sin. And then that's when you have to go through and the someone, rest of the... Yeah, someone somebody squeeze just that jelly out of that donut. And that's a sad picture, but <laughs> that's what happens. And I'm going to Krispy Kreme after this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to Duncan after this. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Duncan. I don't know. They bake their donuts. It's just horrible. <laughs> I don't I don't get into the, the, the house anymore. It's all good. So, yes, there is this cycle of grace and works where I've heard it said from Catholics, and I also read in the catechism where you God is giving you the grace to perform the works. And at, in the performing of the works, you are now accruing more grace. So you're being infused with more grace. And there's this cycle. Whenever you commit a sin, a little bit leaks out. But then you go and do penance, another sacrament, or you do the other sacraments, and you're still infused with more. And as you mentioned, in the catechism, it also talks about this storehouse of grace from Mary and, and the saints throughout, throughout history. And um, where in the world is this in the scriptures? No, it's not. That's, that's my big it's question. Not, it's yeah. definitely not in scriptures. It's, it's added in. You yeah. know, well, this, this gets, gets back into a whole other issue. We should do a whole show on Roman Catholicism. Yeah. But, you know, when you place your, your supreme leader, mm-hmm. when, you know, when the Pope speaks, ex cathedra, you know, yeah. his, his, his words are on the same level as scripture. Yeah. And so that's, that's why you can have a catechism that has theology in it mm-hmm. that comes from popes and is considered on the same level as yeah. the Bible. Yeah. So that's a whole another yeah. yeah. issue it, there. It is definitely a um, uh, just kind of a, a wicked way of uh, thinking about theology, where you look at tradition rather than just trusting in 
the sufficiency of scripture, which yes. is another great topic. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but re- really need it back in to baptismal regeneration. Mm-hmm. So Roman Catholicism is one good example of baptism being a work that is needed for salvation, showing that Christ ultimately, his work on the cross is insufficient. Um, maybe you have other examples of... Uh, I think, uh, you know, just to bring in a little clarity, uh, I think some Christians uh, who are not of the, the Baptist church tradition mistakenly think that the Baptist church believes in baptismal regeneration. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, every good Baptist church does not believe in baptismal regeneration. For the Baptist church, baptism is more of uh, a connection to uh, church, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for, um, uh, membership. Yep. Yeah. So uh, in the Baptist church, you know, they're called Baptist, but that doesn't mean they believe in baptismal regeneration. It means that uh, your membership connection to this uh, this fellowship of faith mm-hmm. uh, is found in your baptism. Your, and when you're water baptized in the Baptist church, that's uh, one more step of, of your participation mm-hmm. in, in church membership, right? Yeah. So the Baptists, uh, at least the good Baptist churches, do not subscribe to baptismal regeneration. But most Church of Christ do. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't know that either. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, at, at the highest level of leadership in the Church of Christ, you know, when you, when you see a breakdown of their theology, uh, water baptism is necessary for salvation in, in, in most Church of Christ. I think there are a few uh, who have kind of strayed away from, from this belief system, uh, but they're the aberrant, you know, Church, church of Christ. They're, they're not in line with uh, the, the standard theology uh, yeah. uh, and distinctives of, of, of the Church of Christ, right? Uh, and and then, uh, then the hyper Church of Christ <laughs> is, is the International <laughs> Church of Christ, Oof. which you find a lot of, uh, on uh, college campuses, a lot of active ICC members, International mm. Church of Christ. Uh, functioning on college campuses, uh, and, and their Church of Christ on steroids. You know, it's like uh, church. Of, you know, the average Church of Christ believes that you have to be baptized in their water, but ICC doesn't even accept <laughs> the baptism of, of yeah. the Church of Christ. You have to be ICC baptized yeah, in, yeah. in order to, to really uh, be saved. And so, uh, you have to understand that you know, uh, you know, one group that has really popularized Church of Christ is the Duck Dynasty guys. Yeah, I remember those guys. Where where have they gone anyway? You know, they're duck hunting or something. Yeah. I don't know. Where I don't know where they're at. But you know, all those guys were Church of Christ. Yeah. And when you listen to their testimony, it's it's always like you know, it was there Come in the, the water. It was there in the water. You I know, where that. where I confessed to Come my, to the water. And so that's that's the concept in Church of Christ is that you have to be confessing Jesus Christ as you're being baptized in the water, mm-hmm. and and now you're now you're saved when you do that. Yeah. It's always a it's always a secret formula. Yep. It's always a mechanism somehow. Yeah. So we. So I mean that that is clearly works based salvation. Mm-hmm. If I have to be water baptized to be saved, uh, now I have you know Christ's work isn't sufficient. It's Jesus, his atoning sacrifice plus this thing that I did. Yeah. It's shake and bake, and I, <laughs> and I helped. You know, it's like <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm-hmm. You know, you were looking at, uh, at at their website a little bit earlier. Yeah. And, and I, I don't think they come right out and say, you have to be water baptized to be saved. Yeah. Right. But you certainly see it in their actions and in the implication that you still have to be water baptized in their church. Yep. And confess your allegiance to yep. their watchtower organization, to the organization. Yep. for your salvation to be acknowledged. So yeah. the implication of that is you have to be baptized Jehovah's Witness in order to be saved. Yeah, you know, this, this reminds me of a conversation. It's, it's kind of a similar conversation where um, I think was talking like a Seventh-day Adventist. And, um, you know, they, they believe um, in, obviously, Sabbath worship. Yes. So, I, and I always ask the question, okay, if, if you're making such an emphasis on Sabbath worship, if I were to die right now, you know, worshiping on the first day of the week, Will I go to heaven? And that's kind of a similar question that I would like to ask these, these people that believe in baptismal regeneration or any people that are trying to add works is, if I die without having performed that work, will I make it into heaven? I, 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 to me, that's just kind of an easy question to kind of get it out of them yeah. or see them fidget a little bit and see where they truly stand. Because if they answer, well, uh, there's your answer right there. 
is that they are truly emphasizing that to the point of it is a work that needs to be done in order to be saved. Yes. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I have had that, that exact conversation with ICC members, mm. International Church of Christ, and they will not, uh, they will not uh, agree that someone is saved prior to their water baptism. Oh, they just go out right with it? Uh, they, they are full <laughs> on. If wow. you did not get water baptized, you are not going to heaven. I wonder what Bible they're using. Yeah. Yeah. I don't missing know. Missing some pages there. <laughs> <laughs> Might be missing a few pages. Yeah. Uh, Mormons. Yep. Uh, you know, the LDS church. Uh, most certainly. So they take it a step further, right? They do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so not only... Uh, do you have to be water baptized to be saved? But like if you have family members who weren't part of the LDS church uh, and you want to try to secure their salvation, then you can get water baptized by proxy mm. for them. Yep. How about that? I heard um, they, baptiz they baptize by proxy Michael Jackson, Elvis, uh, yeah. they, they, other people. And, and this gets into their genealogy work, which is why I never right. go sign up for any of these genealogy <laughs> sites. You know, it all traces back to the LDS <laughs> church. Nice. <laughs> but uh, you heard it here first. But yeah, the, a lot of the work they do with genealogy yeah. is for this very purpose. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people who go to the temples yeah. on a regular basis to get baptized by proxy for people yeah. that they've discovered. Like, like they're, they're doing their whole genealogy work. They're trying to find out their whole family lineage so that they can go get baptized for each each of these uh, family members. So they're not really old. They're just. They just look old because of all the water they've been getting into. That's right. right. Okay. <laughs> They're that all is. wrinkled. Yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but, but what yeah. about what about my favorite one is Pentecostals? Oneness Pentecostals, such a fun name, but yeah, such a dangerous, <laughs> yeah. dangerous doctrine here. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, they they take a different twist on this. So they they say that you, it needs to be done only. Because they're oneness, right? So just backing up a little bit, we, I think we talked about this last yes. last uh, month, last episode. Oneness Pentecostals um, are not Trinitarian. They are Unitarian, but they believe in modalism, where it is God who has put on, he goes through different modes, right? Um, <clears throat> and so when it comes to baptismal regeneration, they take this weird step and they say, when you're being baptized, you must be baptized only in the name of Jesus. Yes. Not the Father, not the Holy Spirit. Um, I guess they haven't read Matthew 18. I don't know. <laughs> well, if, if, well, if you want to be technical about Matthew 18, I mean, if, if we're going to uh, imply that there's actually a name that you're supposed to be baptized yeah. in, it would be Jehovah. Yeah. Not, not Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. because it's the name of the Father, the yeah. Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we talked about that. Right? Yeah. So if you're being baptized in, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, well, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is Jehovah. From eternity past, uh, I am that I am, you know, Yahweh uh, mm -hmm. is God's name. Uh, and in the incarnation, the Son is known as Jesus, which is Yahweh says. Yahweh says, yeah. Right? Right. Uh, but the, the but Jesus is not the name of the Holy Spirit, right? And Jesus is not the name of the Father. But the oneness Pentecostal—that's what they believe—is yeah. that Jesus is His name, and Jesus was the Father in creation, the Son in the incarnation, and then the Holy Spirit in the resurrection. Mm. But His name is Jesus, yeah. right? Uh, and so, yeah, if you get baptized oneness Pentecostal, then you're being baptized in the name of Jesus only. Yeah. But. Overall, though, they still believe that the act of baptism is necessary. Is, is what saves you. Yes. Wow. Yeah, they believe that the act of uh, of baptism is necessary for salvation, uh, and and what they're uh, you know failing to to really uh, understand is what Paul said uh, in in First Corinthians chapter one, it's verse seventeen, where he says, "Christ did not send me to baptize." Mm -hmm. hmm. How's that? He said, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Now, the cross of Christ points to the atonement. The cross of Christ is where the propitiating sacrifice, the appeasing offering was presented to the Father and then accepted, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the cross of Christ is made of no effect if, Baptism is necessary. Right. That's what Paul is saying there. If water baptism is necessary for salvation, you just made the cross of Christ 
of no effect. You've basically said, what he did on the cross is insufficient. And I have to add this work of water baptism. No. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Yeah. Very clear. Mm-hmm. And yet, you have these these churches, you know, I mean, you, you think about, there's there's some pretty big oneness Pentecostal churches. Mm-hmm. A lot of people, even probably some Trinitarians, going to these churches not knowing that they're sitting under a pastor who rejects the Trinity and believes that you have to be water baptized to be saved. Yeah. And yet, those very pastors, when they teach on this topic of, of water baptism, are making the cross of Christ of no effect. Yep. Yeah. It's tragic. Yeah, and so I'm always reminded of that passage in Acts chapter 10, right? This is something that it's, it's like my go-to for when I'm dealing with baptismal regeneration, yes. where Peter is... Uh, uh, waxing eloquent. Sermon, yes, <laughs> waxing eloquent, as he always does. And at that moment, as he's preaching, the, the Spirit falls on a lot of the people there before having been baptized, Right there, there was no baptism going on. He was just speaking a sermon, and so he's he's talking the gospel, and the spirit of God falls on these people, yes. meaning that that is a, a indication, obviously, that they have become children of God at that moment. Yes, and it's at that moment that he he notices this, and then he asks this question: Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he's saying that they, it looks like they've been saved already. Let's go baptize them now yep. after the fact. And this is just a clear kind of reversal of what baptismal regeneration folks are trying to present to us. They're saying, no, it's the act of baptizing that now allows you to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But that's just not so. We have a clear, clear illustration, clear account here in Acts chapter 10. So that's my go-to. Yep. And it's, it's also important to understand that uh, this was the completion of the birth of the church. Mm. So uh, just so you understand what I'm saying here, uh, the baptismal regeneration person typically goes to Acts chapter 2. Ah, yes. Where you see, you know, children of Israel getting water baptized, and then after that, you know, the, the, they start speaking in tongues, right? Yeah. So, uh, or or they, they start speaking in tongues, and, and then Peter preaches a message, mm-hmm. you know, about, uh, you know, uh, being baptized in water and that sort of thing, right? Yep. So, so they go to Acts chapter two, uh, and uh, and they talk about you know Peter's message there after the day of Pentecost, uh, and and while it's true that that the day of Pentecost is the what we might call the crowning of the head of the baby known as the church, the full birth of the church isn't completed until Acts chapter ten. Uh, case in point you find the Israelites receiving the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues on the day of Pentecost. A little bit later, uh, I forget uh, which chapter, I think it's Acts chapter 6, you see the Samaritans then receiving the Holy Spirit, and they all spoke in tongues. Mm -hmm. Then in Acts chapter 10, they're they're at the house of Cornelius. This was a group of Gentiles. And it's there at, at this, this house of this Gentile named Cornelius where the Holy Spirit then falls upon this group of believing Gentiles. Mm-hmm. They all start speaking in tongues. The, the three episodes where everyone started speaking in tongues, this was an indicator that something is happening here so that's unusual, right? Uh, and this isn't something that, that we should uh, see as a normative practice in the church, though I do believe in the uh, perpetuating gift of tongues gift and of tongues. interpretation. I, yeah. I certainly do. Uh, but these are three specific episodes that were used to signify the birth of the church. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit fell upon a group, a specific group, and three specific groups mm-hmm. in the same exact way, signifying that the fullness of the church is now birthed. It was for the Israelite first, then for the Samaritans, who were half Gentile, half Israelite, and then for the full Gentile. And uh, in Acts chapter 10, you have the, the completion of the birth of the church. And it's at that point where uh, the Holy Spirit helps Peter to understand, yes. <laughs> you know, that, they, that not only are Gentiles included, because Peter didn't understand, 
when when he's up on yeah, the house vision. housetop yeah. and has the vision of the food and the unclean animals and don't call him you know and, and then the Holy Spirit sends him to go to the house of Cornelius and and you know don't call unclean what I've called clean and all that had to do with you know okay yeah we can eat pork now <laughs> yeah uh, but but, uh, but what but what it was really pointing to was the acceptance of the Gentiles into right. the church right so then he goes to the house of Cornelius. Uh, that's when the Gentile is uh, allowed into the church. The mm-hmm. evidence being that the Holy Spirit fell. They spoke in tongues. And then Peter's like, well, I guess we can baptize these people too. Yep. Why? Because they just got saved. <laughs> yeah. They just got saved before water baptism. Yeah. So the people who say you have to be water baptized or baptismal regeneration to be saved, it flies in the face of Scripture and... It's a slap in the face of Jesus Christ because it makes the cross of Christ of no effect. Uh, The church that tells people that they have to confess Jesus Christ in water in order to be saved or they have to be, you know, water baptized as babies or they have to receive this sort of, you know, uh, special, you know, water, whatever, Mm -hmm. uh, in order to get saved, they're saying that is Jesus plus my work. And it's an offense. Yeah, so, you know, viewer, if you're um, watching this right now, we just want to remind you, right, we're talking about the sufficiency of Christ and how his work on the cross, his death, is acted as an atonement, as an appeasement uh, to God the Father. And he presented that sacrifice, and he even said on the cross, it is finished. Uh, he completed that act of salvation. It was, it was uh, for the entire world, as we mentioned in 1 John chapter 2. And yet there are sects, religions out there that are trying to add to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross by saying you must do these things. If they don't say it outright that you must be baptized, there's other ways, little sneaky ways that they'll try to do it by essentially saying, well, I mean, you don't have to, but uh, you don't want to risk it. Or, you know, if you die today, then uh, chances are you might not get into heaven, that kind of stuff. These are ways that will, they'll, they'll impose this legalism on you and this and like Bungie said, they'll make the cross of Christ of no effect. So beware, beware, you know, viewer of if you're going attending a church, uh, start asking, what is what does this church teach? What does my pastor believe about um, uh, salvation and, and baptismal regeneration? These kinds of things. And and uh, again, just make sure that you are digging into the scriptures and understanding these things. It's right here. I just want to press the pause button and, and remind you, the viewer, we are streaming live on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash Calvary South Austin. We're coming to you live from uh, Calvary South Austin here in Austin, Texas. And we're having a discussion right now on the sufficiency of Christ. Afterwards, we will have Q&A time. Uh, We'd love to hear your questions. You can uh, submit your questions various ways. Number one, we have the live chat going on on YouTube. Say hello there. Enter your questions. They'll queue them up. You can also email your questions to us at outreach at calvarysouthaustin.com. And also, you can call in your questions. We are also streaming on Austin Cable Access Channel 11. If you're viewing us on television, we um, applaud you, number one, and we appreciate you tuning in. So you can call in your questions at 512-576-5433. That's 512-576-5433. And again, just a reminder here at Calvary South Austin, we have opened up the doors of our church. Uh, You can join us for our our Sunday and Wednesday services, Sunday mornings at 9.15 a.m. and 11.15 a.m. And then on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., Again, we've taken all the necessary safety measures. We're actually make... baptizing people in Purell, right? Yes, we're baptizing yeah. people in Purell. And uh, if I could say that word, <laughs> Purell. And yeah, we've taken all the necessary uh, safety measures, guys. Social distancing, <laughs> hand sanitizer, masks. Uh, we just want to, uh, people to enjoy fellowship face-to-face, but also uh, stay safe during this time while doing so. So come on out. If you have any questions, call our church. Again, that number is 512-576-5433. We will get on with our discussion here. So we're, we talked about baptismal regeneration, and uh, now we are going to start talking about uh, other works that people are trying to add mm. to Christ's work on the cross. And one of them is just the idea of having sacraments, yeah. you know, just uh, rituals, religious rituals that they start to say that you must partake in these in order to be either a, a good believer or it's actually necessary for salvation yeah uh, one uh, uh, one form of that is the the Eucharist in the Roman Catholic Church yes that that uh, it is a sacrament yeah you know that's a sacrament that uh, infuses yep 
going back to that technical term. Yeah, donut, yeah. <laughs> yes, that's right. Rather than impute, rather than standing under the imputed righteousness, that covering of Christ's righteousness, uh, the, the Roman Catholic is receiving. Uh, so they they believe a slow infusion of uh, Christ's righteousness. And one way that they think they they're receiving that is through uh, the Eucharist. Yeah. So the Eucharist, meaning that it is the presentation of the body of Christ. <clears throat> through the wafer yes and then the blood of Christ through the wine yes right and, and they and do this on a on a daily basis right through the mass and and they're supposed to do it on a daily basis yeah right yep. so when when you see like like true catholics mm -hmm. uh, when you go to places where where people are actually practicing catholicism they are going to the eucharist every day of the week uh, and the reason why is because uh, they recognize that they need this because they might die tomorrow. And they want to make sure that, you know, all their ducks are in a row, that all their accounts are, are paid in full, right? And so they have to uh, go about doing this work, you know, every yeah. single day. And my, my understanding also from the catechism is that to miss a sacrifice of the Mass, which is the full name, the, yes, sacrifice, the, sacri of the mass, sacrifice of the Mass, is to commit a venial sin. That's right. So you should be, if you're a good Roman Catholic, you should be going to Mass every single day. Yeah, and, and the reason why they think this is uh, so uh, effectual uh, is because within the, uh, within the ceremony yep. of the sacrifice of the Mass, uh, they believe that the wafer turns into the literal physical body of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the wine actually turns into the, the literal physical blood of Jesus Christ. And I shouldn't say that they believe that because there are many Roman Catholics that don't believe that. Yeah. Uh, but it's a sin to not believe it. As a matter of fact, uh, according to the catechism, you're anathema if you're a Roman Catholic and you deny the miracle of the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. If you deny that the wafer becomes the body of Christ, if you deny the belief that the uh, blood, uh, the the, great, the 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 wine becomes the, the the blood of Jesus Christ, if you deny those things, then you're anathema according to the Roman Catholic Catechism. Meaning a curse. Yeah, you're a that curse. is the strongest possible. Yes, it's just like Paul used. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I I, I uh, speak in error if I say that all Roman Catholics believe <clears throat> in this miracle. Uh, but but the catechism certainly teaches it. It's what is taught. Yeah. And the leaders of the Roman Catholic Church certainly teach this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the problems with this is that not all Roman Catholic priests believe it. Mm. There are some Roman Catholic priests who don't believe this, and yet they're distributing the Mass yep. without being able to perform the miracle. So... In Catholic theology, those priests can't perform the miracle, you know, in the transform, transubstantiation is what it's called. Yeah. They're not able to, to, you know, create this miracle of transubstantiation. And so all they're delivering to their <laughs> congregation is a wavering. Of course, yeah. that's all they're all doing. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's a whole nother problem. But mm -hmm. uh, so backing out of that and, and just coming back to the, the sacrament itself. Yeah. Um, if the theology is correct that the wafer literally becomes the body of Jesus Christ and the wine becomes the literal blood of Jesus Christ, uh, then the next act makes sense because they take the wafer, they put it in a monstrance, mm -hmm. which is an ornate cross, sure. and there in that ornate cross is a little window, which is the, the, basically the same size as the wafer. So the wafer goes into the window of this cross, and it's there on the uh, uh, communicate table, uh, and then the congregation begins to worship it. Right. Uh, I, I forget the name of that musician. It's Matt Marr. Is it Matt Mayer? Yeah, Matt Mayer, Matt Marr, something he, like that. He sings, Lord, uh, yeah. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. There's a video of him singing that. And, yeah. yeah. You, you can go look up Matt Mayer on, on YouTube and, and watch his uh, Lord, I need you video. This is a live concert. It's a live concert at a Catholic church. Yeah. And the entire congregation is kneeling down before this monstrance as they worship this wafer. Now, if that wafer is literally the body of Jesus Christ, then they're doing the right thing. But if transubstantiation doesn't actually happen, then it's idolatry. Right. They're, they're worshiping a cracker. Inanimate objects, yeah. I know a lot of crackers. Yep. I know one too. Big one. No, no. no, no. <laughs> Big salty one. No. <laughs> Not one worthy of worship, you know. <laughs> so uh, is there any reason to think, biblically speaking, mm -hmm. 
that transubstantiation actually happens? I don't think so. No, no. not at all. Jesus himself, on the night when he instituted the Lord's Supper, mm -hmm. communion, the, the night that he gave the sacrament and, and, and modeled the sacrament for the rest of us. Yep. He, which Paul uses. Yep. Which Paul uses. Paul actually quotes, quotes you know, Jesus Christ. And, and Jesus, standing there, takes bread mm -hmm. and says, take, eat, this is my body. Right? He takes a symbol... He doesn't take a piece of, he doesn't take a thumb off. He doesn't take a part, a, a chunk of flesh. Yeah. Right? So the, the, his body's literally there. Yeah. And at no point does he ever explain that he's doing some miracle. He doesn't ring a bell. You know, he, there's no performance. He doesn't put in a monstrosity. He doesn't do any of these things. He just takes bread and he says, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Right? Don't do this because it's me. But do this in remembrance of me. And it takes the cup and, and, and offers up the same uh, basic formula, right? Yeah. So there's no reason from the Lord's institution of this sacrament for us to think that the bread is literally going to become the body, that the wine is literally going to become the blood. Yeah. Yeah, they, I understand that they call it a mystery, of course. It is something that, I mean, it's not fully understandable, They admittedly, right? But all this makes sense to me, right? That they have they have to partake in this sacrament. They have to hope in that. They have to depend on that for their salvation to receive that grace. Because it, it, to me, it all comes down to that distinction between infusion yes. and imputation, That's right? right? So if it's if infusion is the doctrine, which is not found in the Bible, imputation is clearly. Yes. But if we're going with infusion, then it makes sense that as you lose grace. You're you're losing, um, yeah. You're lo you're literally losing your righteousness. Yes. Because imputation is a legal declaration. You're not made perfect. Your perfection will come, you know, on the other side of this reality. Imputation is a legal declaration of righteousness. So you still have your flesh to battle with, but the Holy Spirit is working out that sanctifying work, as it's talked about in the scriptures, and and He's. Uh, transforming you into the image of, of Jesus Christ. That's imputation. You're legally declared righteous. But with Roman Catholicism, there's infusion. So when you lose that grace, you are literally becoming less righteous. And so then it makes sense that you have to be presented with the sacrifice of the Mass on a daily basis. Meaning, I mean, they wouldn't, they, in fact, they talk about how, no, no, it's not a re-sacrifice because no, no. the sacrifice only happened once. Yes. But they use terms of, we're representing it's a, it's a bloodless sacrifice but we have to represent it and for those that partake of the sacrifice of the mass every day they are then being infused with more grace because they have to yeah. they have to become perfect they are not legally declared righteous they have to become perfect through these works and so works based on this idea of infusion has to be part of the mix yes. And, and they're, once again, ignoring the verse that you've correctly quoted a few times tonight, which is when Jesus declared, it is finished. Mm -hmm. the, the, the term that he used in Greek is an accounting term, which could be also rendered account paid in full. Mm. So there on the cross, before the Lord died, he said, account paid in full. Not maybe... Yeah. Later, at some point in time, after you've taken enough, you know, sacraments, but at that point in time, our spiritual account was paid in full. The sin debt that we owe, paid in full. Paid in full. And, and then Paul goes on and says that this was a sacrifice that was offered once and for all, which is not only encompassing of all mankind, right, but also encompassing every sin, once and for all. Yep. Once right. for all time, yep. So the doctrine uh, by which uh, God's righteousness is slowly infused to those who come back to every Mass and receive, you know, the Eucharist, uh, that is just not a biblical concept. Yeah, and it's, it's sad to, you know, when we used to go out on campus and we used to have these conversations, 
that I, I have plenty of conversations with Roman Catholics because they, they have a, a parish down there. And we get into these conversations about how they're trusting in those sacraments. Right. You know, and I bring up, you, a lot of times I bring up, have you, do you understand that the catechism is teaching this, but scripture is teaching otherwise? And sadly enough, again, it comes down to that they have not just poured in the time into reading scripture. They're trusting in the traditions that have just been passed down to them uh, from their, you know, from their leaders there at yeah. the parish. So right now I just want to press pause, guys, because we have to uh, get off of cable channel Access 11. They're kicking us off. They're kicking us off. And we're going to, we're still streaming live on YouTube. So if you're watching on channel 11, join us on YouTube, youtube.com slash Calvary South Austin. And uh, join us there, guys. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. All right, we're back. We're back on YouTube. Uh, thank you for uh, being patient with us. We had to scarf down some, uh, some donuts there. We're just getting too hungry. Also, I, I believe we we're receiving a lot of calls there on through the phone that uh, they're expecting a million dollars. Sorry, Bungie misspoke. <laughs> You're not getting a million dollars. That offer was not, was not real. Sorry about that. But what we are talking about, guys, is, uh, again, the sufficiency of Christ. We've talked about, uh, you know, how people are, uh, there's sex, there's religions, there's uh, people out there who are trying to add to what Jesus has accomplished on the cross and what scripture clearly teaches us what he has accomplished and they're trying to add works so we've talked about baptismal regeneration we've talked about limited atonement we've talked about christian universalism and right now we're talking about sacraments and specifically roman catholic church um you know the the sacrifice of the mass is, is a sacrament that must be done and just how this is has no basis in scripture and, and there's just a lot of error going on there what's a what's another sacrament that um, comes to mind bungie is we consider the sufficiency of Christ. Well, uh, drawing a blank. I, I, well, I would I would just point to the celestial law yeah. of Mormonism. You know, there's there's a slew of works there that are necessary so that uh, the uh, member of the LDS Church can go on to become a god of their own planet. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, you know, while there's a, a great deal under the heading celestial law, yep. uh, they basically have to keep all of it yep. uh, in order to uh, uh, engage in what's, you know, called the eternal progression, mm -hmm. you know, as a person goes from human to God uh, and then gets to go and become a God over their own planet, right? Yep. Uh, but that's not something that's based in the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Now, they, uh, the LDS Church teaches that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that he is our Savior, uh, right? But as we saw in our study last week, they've got a different Jesus who is not found in the Scriptures, but rather he is the uh, spirit brother of Lucifer, the spirit brother mm -hmm. of, of us all. Uh, and, uh, and so while they do, they, they do believe that this Jesus of theirs uh, died on the cross for our sins, uh, they also... Uh, insist that you maintain celestial law, which is, uh, to sum it up, you know, is basically uh, a form of, uh, of uh, works of perfection, which uh, comes under the heading repentance. So just to, just to keep it simple, uh, it, when you hear uh, a member of the LDS church or, or the Mormons uh, tell you that, that you, need to be, you need to repent to be saved, you know, the, in, in the Christian hearing we go, yeah, that's what the Bible teaches. You have to be, re repent to be saved, right? But when you open up the envelope of what uh, LDS theology uh, says about repentance, what you discover in this, uh, in this envelope of repentance is it's kind of like when the Catholic says we're saved by grace. Mm -hmm. What they really mean is we're saved by God's grace who graciously allows us to do works Keep until it. we can be saved. Meritorious right? works. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, so you don't mean grace then. Yeah. <laughs> Here's what you mean, right? Yeah. Well, similar with the LDS church. When they talk about repentance, what they really mean is work your way to heaven. Yeah. When, when you open up the envelope of, well, what does it mean to repent? Uh, and, and is there such a thing as deathbed repentance with the LDS church? The answer is no. Mm -hmm. You can't repent on your, on your deathbed. You have to maintain sinless perfection uh, for, uh, for, for, for a season of your life to show that you, you sincerely repented, right? Yeah. 
Now, if you get into this conversation with a member of the LDS Church, uh, then, uh, you know, the, the idea is that, well, you know, repentance is a process, right? So I might repent of uh, a handful of sins today, but there's still sins that I, I don't even know about yet that I might need to repent of tomorrow, right? And, okay, yeah, I, I grant that, right? But repentance isn't complete until you have actually stopped sinning. Uh, one one verse in, uh, I believe it's Doctrine and Covenants, uh, which is one of their standard works, is by this you shall know if a man repenteth, be behold, he will forsake his sins and, and stop and, and not, uh, uh, he will forsake, he will stop sinning and forsake all of his sins, basically. The, yeah. the concept being, you know, that true repentance is seen in the life of the person who stops sinning and maintains that sinless perfection until their deathbed. Yeah. I remember uh, talking with a with an old old guy uh, in Utah. He was a Mormon. And, or he had uh, just finished getting baptized by proxy. <laughs> that's, <what it> that's. <laughs> that's right. Or he had just gotten out of the water <laughs> for, for an all day event. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, but but I uh, I asked him. You know, he was he was real upset with me. You know, because I was telling him that Christ's work is sufficient. Mm -hmm. You know, I was letting him know that it is finished. You know, I'm trying to help him to understand that he doesn't have to work his way to uh, into the good grace of God, right? Uh, and and he, he goes, you know, so you're not a Mormon, you know? And I said, no, I'm not. I'm a Christian. He said, well, you should be. And I said, well, let me ask you this, sir. I, I said, um, have you yet been able to keep celestial law? And I mean, you, I, I thought the guy was about to have a heart attack. And, I, and so I asked him, I said, I said, have you repented of all of your sins? Mm -hmm. And he said, no, not yet. And I said, well, you're getting up there, sir. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're getting to the end and there's no deathbed repentance. When are you going to finally repent of all your sins? Yeah. And I kid you not, the guy just turned around and stormed off. You know, if, if he had the strength, he would have stomped. But <laughs> <laughs> to go get another baptism. <laughs> <laughs> to go get baptized. Yeah. Again. So, you know, the, the concept of celestial law, I mean, you know, I don't know if we could, you know, technically call the, the, these sacraments, but it, it, it most certainly is a, a series of good works. Yeah that include the repentance of all sins, right? And, you know, I've had a... I've had uh, uh, Mormons, you know, want to argue about, well, you, you know, uh, repentance is a process, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I simply ask them, so do you need to repent of some of your sins or all of your sins? And they say, well, all of my sins. Yep. And then I ask, so do you need to repent of all of your sins some of the time? Or do you need to repent of all of your sins all the time? And they always confess, you have to repent of all your sins all the time. I go, when are you going to do that? And they, and, and they always say, well, no one, nobody's perfect. And I say, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly right. Yes. <laughs> but then they go, but that's what repentance is for. I go, no, no. You, <laughs> you stop, just, you stop yeah. sinning is repentance. Yeah. <laughs> so here's how you know if you've truly repented, you've stopped sinning. Right. So if you stop sinning for a year and then you commit a sin after that year is up, mm -hmm. it just proves that you didn't actually repent a year ago. Yep. So another form of Christ's work is not sufficient. I have to work my way into God's good grace. Yeah, this, I was reminded of a verse um, in Mormon scriptures, 2 Nephi 25, 23. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, so this is what it states. For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. Interesting. Because if you know your scriptures, if you know Bible, you'll notice that phrase, right? It is by grace that we have been saved, which is oddly somehow finds its way word for word in 2 Nephi. Yeah. But it's taken from Ephesians chapter 2. So I want you to understand, Mormon scripture says, it is by grace, unmerited favor, apparently, after all we can do. Yep. So they're tacking on works. Ephesians chapter 2, verses, verses 8 through 10. Paul writes, For by grace you have been saved through faith. That's that phrase that, that we just saw. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for, for good works. Paul clearly says, you are saved by grace. 
God didn't have to save you. It is un, unmerited by his own grace, by his own love. He chose to save the world. And he says, it's not of works, lest anyone should boast. Meaning, if it were of works, then you would have every person start pointing fingers and say, well, I'm better than that guy. I deserve to go in. I'm better than that person. They'd be pointing the finger right back. No, I'm better than them. Look at my list. Lest anyone should boast. It's not of works. But yet Mormon scriptures in 2 Nephi says, you're saved by grace after all we can do. And that's where they start getting themselves tripped up because they say, we have to do all we can do. Have you done it? No. You're stuck. And then uh, President Kimball, uh, former president of the LDS Church, uh, actually explained what is all you can do. And he tells the story basically of, of a soldier who uh, has a commanding officer who comes and says, I want you to deliver this letter to you know, the, uh, the, the place where the mail goes, right? And so they're on base and you know, they, they wanna take this, he wants this soldier to take this letter over to uh, the, the, the mailbox, right? And, uh, and the soldier uh, you know, bows up his chest and says, you know, I'll, I'll do my best, sir. He goes, nah, I don't want you to do your best. <laughs> I want you to deliver, de yeah. deliver this letter. And he goes, I'll do it or die, sir. And the, and the commander says, I don't want you to do it or die. I just want you to, it's, the task is easy. You can do this. You know, just go deliver the letter, right? And, and this is his explanation of after all we can do, right? He's basically saying, look, what you've been told to do, you can do it. Mm -hmm. and, and he goes on to, to give a, a perfect Yoda, you know, which is there is no try, <laughs> only do, right? Uh, and, mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> You know, so here's the president of the LDS Church saying, you know, that you, you know, it's not that you have to try to do it, just do it. You can do it, mm. right? So, uh, according to the LDS Church, uh, you, you have everything you need to 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 repent of yeah. all your sins and be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Mm. But none of them are. Yeah. I know a lot of great Mormons, you know, I got a, I got a great friend that, that uh, he's moved away, but, you know, we used to ride a lot together and great guy. I, mean, I love the guy, uh, you know, but he's not perfect. He'll, yeah. he'll be the first to admit it. You know, he's never once suggested that he's perfect. Um, I just feel bad that he's embraced a theology that requires him to be perfect by the very uh, doctrines that they teach. Yeah. And, uh, and it's sad that uh, it's, it's, it's a works-based religion that results in zero salvation. Yeah. Um, I was also reminded of uh, Paul in Romans 7, right, where he sets up this, this conundrum that the Mormon is facing where they're not perfect, they understand that, but then they also understand that, well, the standard is perfection. And, and the way Paul puts it, he says, um, he says, for I know that in me nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, mm -hmm. but how to perform what is good I do not find. Yeah. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. I but the that evil that I will not to do, that I practice. So he's saying, I want to do good things, but I can't because my flesh. And I, the things that I don't want to do, I wind up doing those, right? And right at the end of this whole passage, he says, oh, wretched man that I am. He, mm -hmm. he confesses it. Who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Sufficient. 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 Who will deliver me? Christ will. Yep. Sufficiently. Amazing. So to our Mormon friends out there, or if you have Mormon friends and family members, this is something uh, you know, to, to raise to their attention. Uh, is Christ sufficient? Mm -hmm. So then we move on to another issue where People are trying to add works. And it's uh, oddly enough, yeah, something that uh, you wouldn't expect, but evangelism, this, mm. this concept of going out there and preaching the good news, preaching the right. gospel message or preaching the way to be saved, right? Uh, and yet there are religions out there that maybe not outright tell you that it is demanded of you for salvation, but in the way that practices out, you know, practically speaking, within the religion, it turns evangelism into a necessary component, right? right? And I'm thinking the ones I'm familiar with are Jehovah's Witness. Yeah. You know, they, they come knocking on your door Saturday mornings, 
And, you know, I do hear a lot of Christians, right? It's like, man, we, why can't I be like that, right? Well, I, need, I need that kind of dedication. Uh, they, they put us to shame with their evangelism and their, and their techniques. And even during this COVID time, right, I've received letters, handwritten letters from our Jehovah's Witness neighbors. And they're just presenting, hey, you know the scriptures, you know, we invite you to have a conversation. And on one level, you're like, oh, wow, that kind of stings. We're, I'm not writing any letters. I'm just trying to live over here, right? Just trying to survive. And yet when you dig a little bit into it and you hear testimonies of former Jehovah's Witnesses especially, you kind of see behind the curtains and you see the legalism, what's imposed to them and why they do so much evangelism. And, you know, from what I've heard, what I've understood is that they, they the organization, right. the leaders the, over... The watchtower. The watchtower, yes, there you go. The Eye of Sauron, <laughs> they are documenting hours worked. They are yes. imposing regulations of, or quotas to meet. And if you meet those, they extend them a little higher. And essentially, you are now sacrificing much time with your family and much time doing other things. And really, it just turns into you must do evangelism for the majority of your time. Right. Otherwise, you're in danger of becoming a bad, having bad status or yes. ultimately becoming disfellowship within Jehovah's Witness organization. I, I certainly, uh, I mean, I've heard Christians make those statements of, wow, they really put us to shame. And, uh, and I could wish that, that every Christian would be even more passionate, even more zealous than the Jehovah's Witnesses when it comes to our own evangelism. You know, the, I find evangelism uh, to be uh, something that uh, most Christians uh, uh, don't, aren't, aren't really that interested in, you know. And, and uh, I, I know that there are some who, you know, engage in le some, some level of evangelism at, at work or, or with family. Uh, but the idea of like going out, you know, going door to door or, you know, hitting the streets like we go, you know, and that when we go down to campus and, yep. you know, the, the group from our own church, uh, you know, where evangelism is stressed uh, and encouraged, uh, the, the group that actually goes with us down to the campus, it, it's not a large group, right? Yep. Uh, so, uh, so I do look at uh, like the Jehovah's Witnesses and how zealous they are and think, wow, why can't Christians be that zealous? But then I remember, oh, no, they're not doing it because they're passionate about it. Yeah. They're doing it because they have to. Mm -hmm. They're doing it because they're trying to get saved. Yeah. Uh, so it's just a complete different motivator, uh, right? Um, it, it, it's, it, it's just, and it's sad. It, it's, uh, it's legalistic, and, uh, and it's, it's the wrong motivation for something as spiritual as evangelism, right? Uh, similar with with uh, the LDS Church and, and, and you know those who are Mormon uh, are required to go on a two year mission, you know, uh, in order to be a Temple Recommend Mormon. And you have to be a Temple Recommend Mormon in order to keep celestial law, and you have to keep celestial law uh, in order to uh, uh, progress to become a god over your own planet, right? Uh, so uh, if you want to be a god over your own planet. You have to go on a two-year mission. Uh, typically, when you're when you're fresh out of high school, yeah. uh, you know. But uh, but yeah, if you want to be a temple, recommend Mormon and be able to you know, baptize by proxy and, and take take out your, you know, yeah. If you want to do all the things that that a good Mormon is supposed to do, if you want to get married in the temple and all these sorts of things, then you have to uh, go on your mission. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and and you know, not only you know evangelism, but how about giving? You know, that's another form of, of works-based uh, salvation where Christ isn't sufficient is, yeah. you know, the, the requirement to give. You know, you have to give your tithe if you want to, you know, be in good standing with the church. Yeah. I, I even know uh, of, uh, of Mormons who missed out on uh, the, a family member's wedding because they got behind on their tithe and they couldn't pay what they owed the church. And so their status as Temple Recommend Mormon was removed Okay. And, and then, like, their daughter was getting married. And, of course, if you want a celestial marriage, you have to do it in a temple. But in order to go into the temple, you have to be temple recommend. Yeah. And in order to be temple recommend, you have to keep up with your tithing. You know, wow. so, so I know that I know parents that have missed out on their child's wedding because they fell behind on their tithe and couldn't and couldn't pay the deficit. Wow. It's like a caste system. All. It's, it's horrible. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you know, I was, uh, so I grew up 
in El Paso, and there's a well-known... Do um, you know Beto? No, I didn't know Beto. <laughs> Beto you, didn't know you me. Knew a, <laughs> you knew a Beto. Yeah, I did, I did actually. <laughs> and there was a well-known, uh, you know, prosperity church there. There is still. It's pretty big. So they, they linked up with, like, Creflo Dollar, Kenneth Copeland, those guys. So, yeah, you know, I was well, the real good, familiar the good with those. Ones. Yeah, they were, they were big ones. <laughs> and I remember one time there was this call for offering. They do pass the big, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket around back in the day. And they were, there was a building project that was millions of dollars, and they wound up finally building it. But back in the day when they were trying to raise funds for this, I remember there was uh, insufficient funds the previous week. And I'm... I'm I'm not even a teenager yet at this point, but I remember sitting in the audience there, and as he's telling the audience that last week was too little giving, and he was scolding, mm. scolding the congregation there so for giving too little. And there was always this, this, you know, a digital counter of how much, you know, how much funds have been raised up to that point. It was just, I can see the pressure there, you know, the the, the, the legalism, the the mounting pressure that it puts on a person of, well, I mean, I want to be a member here, I want, I, I appreciate the fellowship, but. Um, I, I need to partake in this, right? This reminds awesome. me. I wanted to wanted to bring up your offering record real quick. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Give me the lashes. Yeah, you know, everybody at, at this church knows. I don't even look at yeah. what people give. I, I you have barely no, know how to read. I, that's true. <laughs> I don't do numbers good, but I English great. <laughs> so, uh, nice. <laughs> I, you know, I. Uh, I make it, uh, I guess I would just say that, uh, you know, I don't want to look at people and mm -hmm. see monetary value. Yeah. And, and so uh, since I started pastoring, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I don't mean this in a, in a prideful way, you know, because I know that this could even become a source of pride. I've heard pastors even talking that hold my position, you know, had to, had to get away from this whole mentality because they were... Uh, allowing it to become a source of pride in their life, right? Uh, and so it's, it's not a source of pride for me. Uh, it's just, you know, a protection that, that I want for uh, the people in the congregation here to know that I do not look at uh, line, people as line items yeah. on, on the church budget and, oh, that person gives more, that person gives less, so they get more time, they get less time, they get better you know, service, they get less service. That, yeah. yeah, I just, uh, you know, I have a, a wonderful guy who uh, heads up our, uh, our, our counting mm -hmm. ministry, and he provides me with high-level financials so that I can make good financial decisions with, with our board. Uh, but as far as each person and what they give, I have no clue. Yeah. And I don't need to know. I don't want to know. It's between them and God. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want, I don't, I don't want that pressure uh, of allowing my flesh to start looking at people, uh, you know, for their, their worth uh, you know, through what they give, right? And so I, I see where, I see the danger. I see the danger in the church with like what you're talking about, a Christian church mm -hmm. where, you know, the leaders are, are pounding the pulpit and requiring more because they got a vision and they got to somehow work the sheep up into a frenzy to, to give more so that they can accomplish God's plan. Yeah. <laughs> God can't, God can't somehow get you that money without you beating the, yeah. and fleecing the sheep, you know, or, you know, going back to, you know, say like, you know, the Mormons and those who, you know, make it, uh, you know, a, a uh, requirement to give in order to maintain your yeah. your status uh, for salvation. It's those unwritten rules that, man, they bite you. That um, so, you know, there's a in the Gospels, right? That I reminded it's probably not 100% applicable, but in a way, it, it applies it here in Matthew 23, where Jesus is talking about the Pharisees and how they bind heavy burdens, hard mm -hmm. to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Now, yeah. there probably are pastors out there, or, you know organizations that they're doing that the, that work as well but what yep. they don't understand is that they're imposing these heavy burdens right. and when they start saying that this is necessary for you to have be a part of this organization or to have good status in this organization i mean at that moment it's just pure legalism yeah right yeah. and you guys are just kind of you know i'm, I'm reminded of pilgrim's progress where you know the christian he's he has this big burden on his back but what does Jesus say in the Gospels later on um, in Matthew? He says, come to me, all you who 
labor and are heavy laden, yeah. and I will give you rest. I'm heavy laden. Yes, you are definitely heavy laden. Go to Jesus, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> Go to Jesus, and I will give you rest. Jesus, sufficient. He will give you rest. And his burdens are light. Yes. Right? It's amazing. It's amazing how we are just missing these clear teachings in Scripture. If yeah. people would just dig into their Bibles for themselves yep. and uh, just, you know, take from Scripture, taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, what do you think? You, you want to get to questions or you want to you continue to develop some more of this? Uh... I think we're at a good stopping point here. We can take some questions. Uh, we got a couple lined up in the queue. Um, so just for you viewers out there, we are closing up our discussion portion here. We've talked about the sufficiency of Christ. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. And we're going to turn our attention now to some Q&A time. Just as a reminder of that on YouTube, uh, you can uh, uh, put in your, your questions there in the live chat. Make sure to sh share the link on all your social media platforms. Social, social media platforms. Sally sells seashells by the seashore. There, I got oh, it. Oh, you got it. And That's pretty good. Uh, share on Facebook, uh, Instagram, all those platforms, guys. Not TikTok, though. It's gone away. Don't do it. Um, and you can uh, email your questions in, outreach at calvarysouthaustin.com. So we've got a couple of questions lined up for us here. Number one, let's see. You have a friend who is Catholic and believes that faith plus works, sacraments, is the way to go. You get very little time to talk about Jesus with them. How do you, in two minutes, explain the sufficiency of Christ's complete work on the cross? Yeah, okay. This is a challenge more like than a question, two right? Two minutes. You got two minutes. Do it. And all these uh, qualifications. All right. So, yeah, you're talking to a Catholic, um, and they're, they're set. They understand faith plus works. They understand the sacraments is the way to go, and you, you got very little time with them. How do you explain the sufficiency of Christ, uh, complete work on the cross? And here is where I, I've had plenty of these opportunities, and I, this is where I, I always go. I love going to Ephesians chapter 2, and I read that passage a little earlier, but it says how you have been saved it has all the components there, basically. It's the gospel message there in a nutshell. And so I like taking them to Ephesians chapter 2, and I have them read along with me. And I said, hey, I understand you're, you're doing the sacraments, and um, you understand that you know, that's, that's how you would get the good graces, literally, uh, by God. Let me read this uh, verse along with you. You have been saved by grace through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, Lest any man, lest every man should boast. And so I, I just kind of walk them through. You have been saved by grace. What is grace? Unmerited favor of God. Not of yourselves. Meaning it's nothing having to do with you. God did it all by himself. He's powerful enough. And it says, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I explain that analogy of, or the illustration about if it were of works, then you would have everybody be pointing fingers and basically banging on the door. I deserve to get in. But God says, No. There are no works tied to the saving work, the gracious saving work of God. And it's explained there in Ephesians chapter 2. So I, I just like taking them to that and explain it to them. And then I let them, you know, walk away and, and they have to chew on that, right? So that's, that's the way I go about it. Maybe have a different uh, method. So one of the things that most Roman Catholics uh, believe is that rosary prayers will uh, release someone from purgatory. Uh, but it's never been uh, quantified uh, how many of those prayers mm -hmm. must be offered. Uh, so one way that, that you can go about this is by asking them, how many uh, prayers of the rosary uh, does a person have to pray for an individual before that individual is released from purgatory? And, of course, they don't know. Uh, so uh, then w what, what good is it? Like yeah, if, you if, if you can't quantify what it... Uh, what it takes to pray the rosary to spring someone from, from purgatory, uh, then how can we know if anybody would ever be released? Uh, also, what do you do with the last person who dies? <laughs> Who's praying for that guy? Who's going to pray for the last person? Yeah, and you right? know the guy. Yeah. It's going to be a guy, yeah. <laughs> but uh, actually, it'll probably be a woman because yeah, they, they live longer. <laughs> but... Uh, so, uh, you know, there's so many problems with, with the prayer of the rosary. And so you might begin the conversation just by asking, hey, do you know how many prayers you have to pray to get someone out of purgatory? Uh, and, and they won't know. Uh, and, and then you can simply just ask them, well, well, then can you help me to understand what Jesus meant when he said it is finished? They're on the cross. 
before he bowed his head and gave up his spirit, he declared, it is finished, which means account paid in full. What was he talking about? Mm. And a lot of times when I, when I uh, talk with uh, those who belong to different uh, religious systems, you know, I'll present a, a, a question. Allow them to teach me something, right? You explain to me what Jesus meant here when he said, it is finished. And, and how is it that it's finished there on the cross, and yet you still believe that there is an ongoing sacrifice at every, at every Mass, why, why is there an ongoing sacrifice when Jesus himself put a period at the end of his death sentence? Yeah. Right? Yeah, see what I did there? Yeah, I do. <laughs> or or uh, you might also uh, take them to Hebrews 7, mm-hmm. um, where Paul tells us that Jesus doesn't need to daily, as those high priests, to offer yes. up sacrifices for first That's for his own for. sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself, right? Uh, perfect perfect uh, text right there. He did this once for all. Not once and it continues, but he did this. It's past tense, once for all. When, 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 when he offered up himself. Yep. Not as he continues to offer up himself. Uh, another, an, another place that you might go is Hebrews 6. Uh, uh, Hebrews 6 is actually a text that I used uh, with a Catholic lady who uh, became a Christian. Uh, and uh, this was just one of the uh, questions that I posed to her along the way of, uh, that, you know, eventually uh, helped her to, to convert to Christ. Uh, but, I mean, she was, she was a staunch Catholic. And um, her family came here, but she would come and visit, but mainly she went to her Catholic church. And, and then we, we would have conversations about it and whatnot. And, uh, you know, one of the times that I saw just those gears, those rusty gears just break free. And, you know, I saw her start thinking about things in a whole new, another way, um, was when I, uh, brought her to Hebrews chapter six. And, uh, it's here in Hebrews six where, uh, Paul's talking about the, the elementary uh, principles of Christ, and he's saying, let us go on to perfection, not laying on the foundation of repentance from dead works, or faith towards God, right? Uh, and, and he gets down to verse 4 here, and he says, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again mm-hmm. for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. So, so in other words, you know, if you have a, a believer who falls away or falls back into sin, right, and commits sin worthy of judgment, it's impossible to bring them back to the point of repentance. Uh, in other words, uh, the, the, uh, we don't need to get saved again. We don't need to come back to the cross over and over and over again, because what you're actually suggesting is that Christ has to be re-crucified. Now, why would Christ have to be re-crucified if he continues to be crucified? Yep. If Paul believed that the Eucharist was Christ continuing to be crucified, then he would simply say, look, if you fall away, just go back to Mass. Mm-hmm. Because there, tomorrow, Christ is going to be continually crucified for the sins that you committed when you fell away. But he didn't say that. He said, no, if, if you think you need to get saved again, if you think you need to go back to foundational repentance, then Christ has to be crucified all over again. And that's not going to happen. So therefore, you don't need to go back to that point of foundational repentance. Yeah. It's impossible to do that. Once you've repented and once you've received by faith, the imputation of Christ's righteousness, that's when the atoning sacrifice sufficiently covers all of your sins, even the ones you have yet to commit. And in this, we have security. Nice. Well, you came in a tad over two minutes. You landed at about seven minutes and 14 seconds. <laughs> I think, I think they'll, they would have stayed with you for that. No, but that's great. I definitely would, for, for Roman Catholic... Point them to Hebrews chapters 6 through 10, and it really just crushes the, that idea of the, the, the sacrifice of the Mass and the representation of, of, of Jesus Christ and his bloodless sacrifice. And read Hebrews chapter 6 through 10, get 
an understanding of that and present that to your Roman Catholic friend. One of the things that I do when I see Catholic bookstores is I'll go in and buy a scapula. So a brown scapula is like a little cloth necklace that you know typically has a little brown square here and oftentimes has like an embroidered Mary in it. And then there's a, a similar one on the back. And uh, the Carmelites believe that if you wear this uh, and, and you have it on when you're dead, it's a get out of free purgatory card, right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, I've done this on a few occasions where I go into a Catholic bookstore and I buy a brown scapula. And, and then I ask the person who is ringing me up if, uh, if they have one on. And inevitably, they say no. You know, most you know, typically you'll see, you know, like uh, when you go down into Mexico, you'll see kids wearing them and these sorts of things. But here in America, uh, oftentimes, you know, most most Roman Catholics don't have the on the brown scapula, but they always have a rosary with them, right? So, uh, so on a few occasions, I've asked the 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 person, uh, you know, if they have a brown scapula on, and uh, it was there uh, on the the mission trail. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the mission trail, uh, in one of the uh, mission uh, buildings there, they have a, a Catholic bookstore. So I went in and did this whole routine, bought the brown scapula, asked the lady <coughs> if she had one on. She said no, but I have this, and she pulls out her rosary. And I said, well, how many rosaries do I have to pray to get someone out of purgatory? And she said, I don't know. And I said, yeah, we don't know that, right? And she, uh, yeah. I said, but you don't have this on. This will get you out, allegedly. If you die... By default. You'll just get instantly yeah. out. Do you have this on? She said, no. And I said, and I took her rosary in one hand, and I took the brown scapula in the other. I said, well, which one's more important? And I mean, she <laughs> looked and looked, and then finally she just goes, both of them. And I said, okay, uh -huh. I'll, I'll accept that. <laughs> you know, but you've only got one. Why don't you have the other? <laughs> She said, yeah, I guess I need the other one, too. And I said, okay. I said, so uh, our transaction's done here, right? And she said, yeah. I said, so if I take this brown scapula and leave, you're not going to call the cops on me, right? And she said, no. I said, so my account here, it's paid in full? <laughs> and yeah. she said, yes. And I said, well, it's interesting. You know, you know who else said that? And I went in and started explaining what Jesus said on the cross with, it is finished and how it means account paid in full. Mm -hmm. And in reference to this transaction, what does that mean for your sin debt? And I could, I could just see these gears just turning in such a way that I, I wouldn't doubt that she's a Christian by now. You mm -hmm. know? I, and I just left the conversation. I just you know, said, you know, think and pray about these things. But Jesus' work is sufficient. He finished the work on the cross. It's done. Yeah. We don't need this or this. We just need Jesus. And, and she agreed. Nice. And, uh, and so left. So that, that's another form of, of, of a conversation that you might have with a, a Roman Catholic. That was under two minutes, though? I, I, I don't remember. I, I think I, yeah, I, probably, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> you know me. Nice. <laughs> Very good. I hope that helps you out. If you need any clarification, let us know in the live chat. Uh, we got another question here. So this is kind of a three-parter, but it's talking about limited atonement. And it starts off saying, so, so why limited atonement? Why and how is this justified uh, you know, by Calvinists or Calvinist doctrine? How do they know they are part of the elect? I guess, so why the need for this doctrine in, in Calvinist, uh, Calvinism? Why the need for limited atonement? Uh, you know, I think uh, one reason why this might be an attractive doctrine to those who embrace Calvinism is the attempt to avoid Christian universalism. Right. If Jesus died for all sins, uh, then the idea would be easily uh, carried out that then everybody should be saved, mm -hmm. which we we dealt with in dealing with the three version or the three acts of imputation. Right. The solution to the problem is really found in that 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 third act of imputation, where the believer then receives the righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith in his sacrifice, thereby avoiding the unforgivable sin. Whereas those who commit the unforgivable sin are still stuck under the first imputation because they reject the second imputation and therefore can't receive the third, right? So uh, if you uh, want to understand what I just said and go back and listen to the recording. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that you know, for, for, uh, for many, uh, limited atonement was one way to get around uh, the uh, the doctrine of Christian universalism to yeah. explain how Jesus can have a uh, 
you know, a sacrifice for sins, and yet some people still end up in hell. Yeah, so I see that, and then I'll, you know, in addition to that, I, I see that it, it's a necessary outworking because there's this tension that arises when you also have the, um, the bondage of the will. There is no, no free will, right, in Calvinism. Right. By nature of who you are, a sinful creature, you will never, there's no, not, there's no righteousness, no, not one, right? Yes, yes. And so they use this and say, no human creature will ever reach to God. But yet, we have uh, people who obviously become saved and people who don't. How do we handle this tension of, well, they can't choose, so they say, well, there's irresistible grace. But then by, because God is sovereign, because of their, their view of God and yeah. his sovereignty, he has to be the one that does the choosing. Man cannot choose. He will never choose God. So he has to be the one that chooses, yes. and therefore, limited atonement. He's the one that has to flip the switch. Yeah, you know the 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 uh, regeneration preceding salvation. Do you have faith because you are regenerated, right? Yeah. The, the idea that God regenerates you and gives you faith so that you, then you can believe. Yeah. Right. Uh, that's part of Calvinism as well. So yeah, I think you're right when you when you analyze each point in tulip. You know, you do have some four pointers who believe in a tulip, <laughs> and they leave out the L because they don't believe in limited atonement, but they believe in everything else. Uh, at the surface level, I think there's a lot about Calvinism that I agree with. You know, if you don't dig in deep and start, you know, defining stuff. Uh, you know, for example, T in TULIP is total depravity. Uh, do I believe that uh, mankind is totally depraved? Well, yeah, I think that we're born sinners. We're under the curse of Adam. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that uh, by nature we're sinners. Uh, and, and yet, if by total depravity you mean I can't choose anything good, well, I don't, you know, when I go to the grocery store and, and I go to, to buy some, some Granny Smith apples, you know, I don't find the most rotten apples there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't say, oh, those, those apples, they look the most evil, you know. And so because of my total depravity, I'm going to choose the, the most rotten apples. You know, these look like they have worms in them. And mm -hmm. no, I, I, I'm going to choose the best apples. Now I'm going to choose the best apples because I'm selfish. And I'm not going to leave them for the next person behind me, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to choose the best apples because I want the best apples for me. And so in that sense, like, uh, you see my depravity. But I can still identify which are the good apples and which are the bad apples, mm -hmm. right? And with that knowledge, I can actually make a decision for what will be the best apples for me. Yeah. Well, why can't I do that with Jesus? Yeah. Why, yeah, did, yeah. why is it that when it comes to the, the question of my salvation... You know, can I not take a step of uh, a free will, even in, in a sense of selfishness, to say, I'm going to hell, and, you know, Jesus is offering me a way out. I'm going to, out of selfishness, choose that for myself. Mm -hmm. But the Calvinist says, no, you can't. You're too depraved. Yeah. What can a dead man do is what they'll ask, right? Yeah. So, so total depravity, do I, do I believe that everyone is born in sin and, and, and depraved and, and uh, you know, that, that there's none good, no, not one? Of, of course I believe all of those things. But listen, when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, they didn't lose information. They gained information, right? Before, all they knew was good. Mm -hmm. But then they sinned and experientially learned about evil. So it's not that Adam and Eve became crippled so that they could no longer choose anything good. As a matter of fact, they immediately recognized they were sinners. Mm -hmm. They immediately recognized that they were guilty before God. They immediately attempted to go and cover themselves because they knew that they, there was something wrong with their nakedness. You know, I mean, yeah. instantly they knew that there was a need for repentance in their life, yeah. a covering of sorts, right? So the idea that, well, because we're totally depraved, we can't ever really, you know, freely see our need for salvation and Jesus, well, that's not true. Now, we're never going to initiate the search mm -hmm. for God. In and of ourselves, we would never initiate a search for God, but with the Holy Spirit drawing us, yeah. we can't respond to that yeah. by faith. Of course we can. Yeah, they, I, my understanding is they see free will as a special work. Yes, Free will, we, in their understanding of total depravity, we freely choose by nature who we are. We always choose 
you know, those unrighteous things. We will, but we will never choose God. So they see free will when it comes to choosing God as a special work. And for those who believe that you can choose to put your faith in God, that it's not only a special work, but it's a meritorious work. Right. So my, my putting faith is, is synergism, as, as they call it, right? Yes. Me acting, cooperating with God to the point that somehow this, this makes God um, not sovereign. Less sovereign. Less yeah. sovereign. Right? Yeah. So he, he, needs, he needs your help. He needs you to, to make a decision. And they somehow see this as a degradation of right. God's sovereignty. But is, Paul makes it very plain in Ephesians 2 that we're saved by grace through faith. Yeah. And that not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Mm -hmm. So right there in that text, he's telling us that faith is not works. If we're saved by faith and not of works, well, then faith must not be works. Yeah. So the argument that, you know, well, if you say that you can get saved by faith, therefore you, you believe in a works-based salvation, no. Faith, uh, you know, in this context speaks of a reception of a gift, right? Uh, you know, so, so it's kind of like if I say, hey, I've got this incredible gift for you. Do you want it? And you receive it. Uh, you know, that's, <laughs> it's, it's a reception. Yeah. That's not a work. Receiving right. a gift is not a work. Yeah. But it is an act of faith. Yep. So, you know, the, to call it a work, it's, it's just a, it's, a, it's a stretching on the limit of what work means. Well, yeah, you, they see it as a meritorious work, right? Because I, I always remember this John chapter 6, verse 29, out of the mouth of Jesus. Jesus said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he right. sent. So he's calling it a work. It's have, a play. It, faith, right? It, it yeah, is a play, it's, right? It's, it's, a, it's a play on words. He's not talking about a meritorious work. Yes. Right? So he, he's not saying somehow this. But back up and look at the question that he's asked. Yeah. What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Right. Right. And what does Jesus say? This that, is the work. This is the work. <laughs> Here's the work. Yeah. Why don't you try believing, right? Yeah. So it's not like he's saying mm -hmm. uh, this is, it's, it's kind of like when the, when the guy comes, comes along and says, you know, what, what must I do to be saved? Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, what does the law say? Right. So he didn't say uh, he didn't come and ask, you know, are you the Messiah that I'm supposed to trust in for salvation? Sure. Jesus would have said to that. Yes, of course. Right. So but that's not what the guy asked. Like, what the guy asked is, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, you have to keep the whole law. That's true. If you want to work your way to heaven, you have to keep all of the law every day for the rest of your life. Right. Yep. So somebody could come along and say, oh, see, Jesus is saying you have to keep the law to be saved. No, he's not. He's answering a very specific question. Look at the context. And that's what I'm saying about that text mm -hmm. is that this, this person comes along and says, what can we do to do the works of God? And he basically twists the question around and says, you know, if you want to work the works of God, have faith. Yep. He's not saying faith is a work. Right. So... Uh, so going back to the question about, you know, uh, why, why the Calvinist, you know, needs limited <laughs> atonement is because it's part of a system of theology mm -hmm. that begins with total depravity, right? Meaning that you're so depraved that you're never going to believe in God, you know, so, so then, you know, he has to regenerate you to believe, right? So that you have your switch flipped and... Then, after regeneration, he gives you faith to believe in Jesus so that then you can be, uh, you know, uh, you can uh, experience that you are elect, right? Uh, so knowing uh, in, in this system of theology, God already knows who he's going to choose and who he's going to reject. It's unconditional election. Because it's, it's whether you believe in double predestination or not, this is mm -hmm. the concept that God predetermines some people to be saved, and then either just doesn't regenerate everyone else, mm -hmm. you know, or he actively predetermines them to go to hell. I think, I think it's both sides of the same coin, sure. right? But uh, I think that the, that the Calvinist who doesn't embrace double predestination just isn't experiencing the, the end of the road of their theology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if they keep going down the end of the road, they'll discover double predestination is a, is a default of the system. But in this system of theology, since God is the one who actively predetermines who is going to have their switch flipped, and then after that regeneration 
believe in Jesus Christ, since God is the one preordaining each salvation, well, then it only makes sense that he would have his son only die for those people. Yeah, it has to be limited. So limited atonement is just a byproduct of the the whole system of, yeah. of, of theology. The dominoes, yeah. yeah. And, and the the person uh, who believes, you know, the, to to think that you know th that someone is elect, or how did how did the question how was it put? Uh, how do they know they are part yeah, of the how elect? How do they know they are part of the elect? Uh, uh, they would probably say that because they believe in Jesus ha and have embraced uh, uh, this system of theology known as the doctrines of yeah, grace. I, I also know that uh, they would point to the perseverance of the saints. Yes. If you are one of those who are who seems to be persevering, who seems to be doing following the commandments of God, and they can't say for sure still, uh, but they would say, based on this, you are part of the elect, yeah. right? But as far as evangelism goes, that's the tricky one, right? Is they're issuing a call, a broad call, which would make it seem as though somebody would have to freely respond to that call. Yes. But it seems that what they're merely doing, I think I've heard, uh, you know, some popular Calvinist preachers talk about this, is how, why do we do it? Well, because we're commanded to. That's right. Because we're commanded to. And so we're issuing the call and we're giving an opportunity for God to essentially, you know, change the heart of stone to a heart of flesh on his own time and his own, his own way of doing it. But we're just merely commanded to do it through the Great Commission. But it's not, nobody's freely responding. God is doing all the work. I've got many friends who are Calvinists and I love them. I know they love the Lord. Uh, you know, so, you know, I don't want it to, to seem like, uh, you, you know, I, I think that a Calvinist, you know, is somehow a bad Christian or something like that. Uh, I know many Arminianists, too, that, that are also, uh, you know, pretty, pretty great Christians, you know. So I know people in both of these camps. Uh, thankfully, these aren't the only two camps. Now, they think that they're the, the only two camps. <laughs> you know, they, they tend to think that, well, you're either this or you're that, and there are other, uh, other options. Uh, and, and to call Calvinism Reformed theology is, is historic revision, you know, because there were other <clears throat> forms of theology in the time of the Reformation which didn't line up with Calvinism, right? Mm -hmm. So Calvinism isn't the only theology true of the Reformation. But, uh, uh, but needless to say, they, they refer to themselves as, as Reformed uh, in their theology. And, uh, and, and, you know, and I love my Calvinistic friends. You know, if you're a Calvinist and, and you're watching, uh, God bless you. Keep studying the word. Uh, understand, I believe in predestination. I believe that God is sovereign. You know, I totally believe uh, that, uh, that we need the imputation of Christ's righteousness to be saved and that Christ's work on the cross is sufficient uh, for our salvation. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and with that, uh, you know, it's not my intention to uh, pick a fight with the Calvinists, uh, but uh, I still haven't had one of them explain to me why God would predetermine me to reject Calvinism. <laughs> nice. Or why you Why have... is God making me reject Calvinism? <laughs> why do I have the same beard as all of you? <laughs> Answer but me that. Don't be jealous. <laughs> I am jealous. Don't be I, jealous. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> this is three years right here. I haven't shaved in three years. I don't know what's going on. All right. Well, hopefully that answers your question, questioner. Um, thank you for submitting that question. Um, I have one more, and we can close out on this. But, um, you know, so we've, we've referenced the works um, faith uh, conundrum here, and it comes from James chapter 2. How should we understand that James chapter 2 passage, right? Because inevitably it's going to come up. I've, I've heard it from Mormons, mm -hmm. and I've heard it from Roman Catholics, right? They always went, well, James chapter 2 points to that. And let me just go ahead and uh, read that passage in question just to lay out some context and we can finish off on, on this one. Uh, James in James chapter 2, uh, I believe starting in uh, verse 14, he says, what is it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What is a profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it, is, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Uh, and you believe that there is one God you do well, even the demons believe and tremble. Uh, so it seems that James is saying, number one, he says, can faith save him? And then he starts bringing up this, this uh, illustration that if you don't feed somebody who needs it, you know, what good is your faith? If it does not have works, it's dead. And so there seems to be this language here that seems, you know, to kind of point in that direction of faith plus works. 
is needed for salvation. Yeah. So it's important to uh, understand that there, there really isn't uh, uh, a conflict between James and Paul. Some people suggest that there is, and the reason why is because Paul's quick to point out that Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness. You know, that's, that's what the scripture says. That I'm reading from Romans chapter 4. Uh, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted or imputed to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted or credited or imputed uh, for righteousness. Right. So, so Paul is telling us that Abraham received the imputation of righteousness by simply believing God. James says that Abraham worked for it. Well, worked for what? What is it that James is talking about? Mm -hmm. When we look at the context of James chapter 2, uh, the concept here is how do you justify your faith in the eyes of somebody else? How did Abraham justify his faith in the eyes of everyone that was watching him? Well, he justified his faith through his actions. Yep. So is it, is it possible that James is writing about one audience and Paul is writing about another? Paul is writing about Abraham's justification in the eyes of God. God saw his faith and then credited that to him for righteousness or imputed righteousness to Abraham's account because he looked in Abraham's heart and saw faith, right? Yeah. And therefore, he received the imputation of righteousness. Whereas James is saying, if somebody says to you, show me your faith. Now, well, now the audience shifts from God to the people in your life, right? Uh, that's why he says, you know, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith with your, without your works. I will show you my faith by my works. Mm -hmm. You believe that, uh, that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, foolish man, that faith without works is dead? So the context here is this. How do the people around you know that your faith is legitimate? How do the people around you believe you when you say, I have faith, if you don't show them your faith by your works? Or think about it like this. If I say, I have faith, and you say, where, where is it? Is yeah. it you, have, you, have, you haven't been doing anything. Is there faith in your pocket? <laughs> you, yeah. you, do you keep it in, the, in, in, in your office? You know, where, where is this faith that you're talking about? Because I don't see it. Yeah. How, well, how, would I, how would I show it to you? Well, I'd show it to you in the way that I live my life, in the way that I serve God, in the way that I worship him, in, in, in the doctrine that, that I espouse. You know, so James is talking about a specific audience. How do you show your faith to the people who are watching you? Paul is talking about a specific audience. God saw the faith of Abraham and imputed righteousness to him. Yeah. Yep. That, uh, I remember when I made this connection in, in um, this, he says, show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. And there's a, an account in Matthew chapter 9 when Jesus forgives and heals the paralytic. And so the paralytic is brought to him, and before healing him, he says, your sins are forgiven. Right. And the people around them started getting irate. Yes. How can he say Just this? Just a little bit. Yeah. And, and <laughs> Jesus, being Jesus, he says, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to heal the man? And what he's basically saying, I mean, obviously it's easier to just say your sins are forgiven because it's just something how, how can anybody really prove that his sins were forgiven, right? It's, it's something that's not material. How can you ever see that? And Jesus, he ends up saying, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, so that basically, so that you will know that I did the immaterial thing, I'm going to tell this paralytic, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. So he showed the power that he had, this immaterial power that he had, by manifesting it through a good work in healing the paralytic. So in the same way that James is talking about, you say you have faith. Anybody can say they have faith. It's, it's, there's this popular statistic that goes around that apparently 90% of Americans say they believe in God, right? And then you ask them, well, show me. Well, their works clearly show something otherwise. There's not 90% of people that <laughs> believe in God, I can tell you that. So James is saying, you say you have faith, then show me your works. True faith will always 
be borne out in the works that you do with your life. And that's going back to that Ephesians chapter 2 passage where he says we have been saved for good works yes. that God has prepared for us beforehand. So it's not the works that get you to the faith right. or that work along with faith. It's faith that is then going to bring about the good works in your life. It's good stuff, man. Yeah. We've got a, a question about the rapture. I think it's a, yeah. it's a bit off topic. Yeah, I um, that so uh, to, the, to the question, I would just direct you to go to the website, calvarysouthaustin.com, uh, and check out uh, my Revelation 4 study on the rapture. Uh, that, that might help you to uh, answer some of those questions. Um, yeah, at some point in time, we'll do a, we'll do a, a show on, on the rapture. Uh, but, uh, but just to keep it on topic, you know, we'll, we'll uh, you know, not spend a lot of time on this. Uh, but, but the question is, uh, uh, is the rapture, uh, basically he's asking, you know, why do people argue that, that the rapture uh, is, is a, a second coming of Christ? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and there are those. I, I've heard that argument that uh, uh, people who teach the rapture of the, uh, of the church are actually uh, teaching a second coming before the second coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the doctrine of the rapture doesn't suggest that Jesus is coming to the earth. Uh, the doctrine of the rapture says that the church is going up to meet Jesus in the air. That's not a second coming. Uh, that's, a, that's a taking away. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Jesus does come to the clouds and catches us up away into the clouds. Uh, but that terminology is used at the time of, of the Lord's ascension when he disappears into the clouds, right? Uh, so uh, whatever these clouds are, you know, I don't know if there's some sort of veil between here and heaven. Where is heaven? You know, yeah. how do we all go up and then go to the same place, you know, when the world is, is a sphere? And that's a whole nother controversial topic. Sorry, flat earthers. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there's a lot of questions when it comes to the rapture. But, but one thing that, that we're not questioning is, is the rapture a second coming? No, it's not. Uh, we don't believe that the rapture is a second coming. Uh, and like I said, I mean, go check out my study on the rapture uh, by listening to the Revelation 4 study. Uh, that might clear some things up for you. Uh, and, and like I said, we'll, we'll have to do a yeah. whole show on the rapture at some point in time. Yeah, I feel like the clouds would have to be cumulonimbus. Maybe. Those are the big puffy ones. Was it a derecho? Yeah, it was a, a derecho. <laughs> nice. So, uh, so then uh, final, final question there. Yep. Is there an exclusivity in Calvinism among those who believe they are the elect? Uh, and is there an elitism among those who uh, ascribe to the L in tulip? Interesting. And, uh, you know, I think so. I think that uh, it almost becomes Gnostic in a, in a specific, in, in a certain way, right? Uh, I think, I remember uh, hearing one, he was a professor at Concordia mm -hmm. and, uh, and staunch Calvinist. And, uh, and he told me one time that uh, uh, he had been in the church for years, had, had you know, served the Lord for years, but uh, then when he heard the doctrines of grace as explained through the TULIP uh, acronym, that, that that's when he got saved, when he received mm. uh, the, the, the Calvinistic concept of TULIP, right? Yeah. Uh, and I, I just, I was like, wow, you know, so... You know, here I am. He knows that I'm not a Calvinist, right? Uh, the implication was, I'm a Christian, you're not. Yeah. And so I, I think that there can be a, a bit of a elitism, you know, for, for those who embrace Calvinism. Uh, I've even uh, come across uh, being out evangelizing. I've come across Calvinists who, you know, set out to spend their time trying to convert the Christians who are trying to evangelize unbelievers, <laughs> rather than helping us yeah. share the gospel with unbelievers, they sat there and wanted to convince all the Christians to become Calvinists, yeah. right? And w lending itself to, the, again, the idea that, you know, those who are in the church aren't yet Christians until they accept Calvinism, right? Now, I'm not saying every Calvinist has this mentality, because mm -hmm. there are um, Neo-Calvinists, you know, who uh, tend to be a little lighter, you know, that, like they believe in Calvinism, but they're not going to cram it down your throat oftentimes, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so I, I, I'm not trying to, you know, do a broad brush uh, on all Calvinists, right? You know, they're not clearly all elitists or, or uh, uh, you know, falling into this secret knowledge, almost Gnostic kind of camp, right? Mm -hmm. 
but I have come across a lot of people who is just like every conversation is them trying to convince me to become a Calvinist, yeah. which always devolves into why do you think I have the free will to make this decision to become a Calvinist? Mm -hmm. You say you're a Calvinist, but you're acting like, like an Arminian by, treat, by, by treating me <laughs> yeah. like I actually have the free will to make yeah. this decision to change my mind. I'm just waiting for God. <laughs> right? If God wants me to be a Calvinist, then he should just make me a Calvinist. Yeah. Right? Don't be mad at me. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, I've, I've had similar encounters um, yeah, with, uh, with Calvinists in that regard. And I, I've heard, you know, that... I guess within the the younger generation that there there does seem to be kind of a that kind of attitude, right? And I, I guess it makes sense, right? When you're young, you you're just excited about what you're learning and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I don't want to paint a broad brush. As the well. young, restless, and reformed. There you go. That's that's exactly <laughs> what they're called. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's let's not uh, also get it twisted, right? Nobody. I don't think anybody's. There's not one person who's not vulnerable to this. Everybody's vulnerable to that kind of mentality, right? When you come across a, a certain doctrine and you hear somebody else espousing another doctrine, you got this gut reaction, this gut feeling that I got to go, I got to go argue with them, right? Yeah. Argue them into the kingdom or something like that. Huh? Uh, we're all, we're all vulnerable to that. And it's just, you know, let's exhibit the fruits of the spirit. <laughs> that's right. Let's have uh, patience, long suffering, kindness, joy, peace. So uh, yeah, that's, that's a good one. That's, that's cool. That came up. Thank you for that question. Well, I think that about does it. I think we're, we're fresh out of questions. and Wraps we're, it up. And I'm hungry. We need some donuts in here. <laughs> Thank you guys for uh, joining us on this great conversation with me and Bungie. Thank you, Bungie, uh, about the sufficiency of Christ. And that wraps up another episode of uh, Studio 118. We just want to remind you we're uh, streaming live from YouTube. Um, on YouTube from Calvary South Austin here in Austin, Texas. Again, we just want to remind you that we have opened up the doors to our church. We um, have in-person fellowship on Sunday mornings at 9.15 and 11.15 a.m. And also on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. Uh, we, again, we've taken all the necessary safety measures to make sure we're staying socially distant. Um, we've got masks and sanitizer and all that. Uh, so come on by. Uh, and if you have any questions regarding our policies, feel free to call the church at 512-576-5433. We'd love to have you on by. And uh, if you guys have any more questions on our topics uh, that we've discussed, e you can email the church uh, at outreach at calvarysouthaustin.com. Thank you guys again for joining. Once again, I'm Ruben. This is Bungie. We're signing out. Have a good night. <laughs>